Hey guys Warren here. This is part 3 of what if Issei was the owner of the Heavenly Crown Sacred Gear. Hit like and subscribe and also don't forget to check the author in the description. Let's start. Chapter 11. Softness of a Seraph. Kokobil's dead? Yes, sir. The report says that he went through with his plot to assassinate the two devil heiresses in Ko, but was stopped by a coalition of devils and angels. I know all that. Why do you think I didn't have Vala step in? I just didn't realize they actually killed him. Can't really blame them, I suppose, but I thought they'd be too afraid to kill someone that's ranked that high. The man sighed, running a hand through his dark brown hair that ended with a golden blonde fringe. Nothing to be done about it now. Is that everything? No, sir. Apparently, the frontrunner in all of this has made great strides towards peace between the devils and the angels. Really? Interesting. Yes, sir. Should we be concerned? About what? The possibility of an alliance being formed against us. If they're trying to make peace between the devils and angels, which are as polar opposites as you can get, I seriously doubt they would be doing so for another war. I'd say we help them out. Keep an eye and an ear open. If things seem to be going well, I'd say there really is a chance to have true peace between the factions. A formal declaration of peace? Exactly. We've been stuck on an armistice for too long. Times have changed and it's about time we all move on with our lives, don't you think? After all, I have all these gears to research. And I believe that there's a brand new one out there just waiting to be researched. Of course, sir. But first, he paused. I have, ahem, important business to attend to. Sir, a brothel does not count as important business. It's not a brothel. The man straightened his outfit slightly. I prefer the term, gathering sight for people in the service industry of companionship. You are vile, sir. Dismissed. Yes, sir. Issei began to stir, his eyes squinting against the bright light as his consciousness returned. The first thing he noticed was how utterly sore he was. Every bone, muscle, and fiber in his entire body felt like it was being body slammed by an orc-based yokai. The second thing he noticed was how comfortable he was. Never before had he been lying on something that felt so completely perfect. It was like he could spend the rest of eternity here, never moving or doing anything at all. So, you're finally awake. Yahweh hummed, as Issei continued to struggle to open his eyes. About time, Yahweh. Issei grumbled out, stretching slightly as he managed to fully awaken himself. Issei. Another, more feminine voice called out. The body from which the voice came from threw itself around Issei. Ow. Issei groaned. I'm so sorry. I forgot. She apologized, quickly backing off. No. It's, it's fine. Issei yawned, taking her outstretched hand to sit up. Gabriel, where are we? Your room, silly. She smiled. Well, your new one. My room? He asked. Yep. You have three members of your brave saint's deck. So, while you were unconscious, Michael finished construction on the building. So, this is the House of Crowns? Issei grinned. Awesome. It is, isn't it? Gabriel agreed. So, how long was I out? Issei asked the hunting question. Almost a week, she admitted. We all miss you, Issei. It's really good to see you again, Gabriel. Issei smiled. Screw it, come here. Gabriel smiled again and entered his embrace, glad to finally have a conscious Issei again. Forgotten about me already? No, it's good to hear from you again, Yahweh. He answered, letting go of Gabriel, though he didn't notice that she wasn't exactly thrilled about their hug ending. Though it hasn't felt like very long to me, unconsciousness and everything. Yeah, yeah, time is relative. I've heard it all before. Yahweh drawled. Didn't you invent that, time? I may be God, Issei, but even Ophis and Great Red have no influence over time. There was only one creature who could but it was severely limited. Anyway, that's not important right now. Uh, right? Issei asked, suspiciously. I believe you have a personal fan club slash harem that's waiting for your safe return dash. I do not have a harem. Issei protested. Sure you don't. But in addition to your harem, you made a promise to Rias, remember? Her marriage to Riser? That's right. Issei exclaimed. I almost forgot about that. What's wrong with Rias, Issei? She asked, tilting her head cutely. Here, help me walk to wherever it is that everyone else is and I'll tell you on the way. Issei scooted over to the edge of the bed and threw his arm around Gabriel's shoulder, who helped ease his way back into movement. And you're telling me instead of punishing me, he went ahead and finished the building? Issei asked as they entered the main room of the Crown's building. MMHMM. She nodded. 
Michael decided that, since he couldn't really stop you from using the cards, it was either finish this place and help you make sure you use them correctly or take them away entirely. Guess he made the right choice. ISSEI. Another feminine voice squealed, covering vast and unquantifiable distance at Mach 10 in order to be the first to greet Issei whenever he entered a room. Yuma. It's good to OF. Issei. Issei. Yuma sobbed, latching onto the angel and nuzzling into his chest. Don't ever do that again. Told you that you had a harem. Yahweh pointed out. I don't dash. Issei sighed and looked at the obviously distressed angel. All right, fine. I have a harem. Ha! Huh. I did it. Yahweh boasted. Suck it, Craig. Ah, uh, who's Craig? He may have been my previous host, and he may have denounced religion because God wouldn't, quote, assist him in getting women to like him. Yahweh finger quoted. He's lucky I was never awakened or I would have made every woman in a ten-mile radius have nothing but contempt for him. So, you wanted me to get a harem just so you could pretend you made women fall in love with me? He say deadpan. No comment. Okay then. He sighed. All right, Yuma. Let me go see everyone else too, okay? Come on. After many a tearful reunion among his friends and more than friends but less than lovers, Issei was now in the occult research club building with his own brave saints, as well as Rhea's peerage. Is Irina back yet? Issei started from his position on the couch. Yuma had won the position on his lap, while Asia and Kates won his two sides. Gabriel asked him to meet back up with her later back in heaven, while Zenovia was exploring the place alongside Griselda. She's perfectly fine, however, she had to go back to England. Rias admitted. They still needed to complete the mission and you sort of took Zenovia. I guess I can't blame her for not saying goodbye. He mumbled, looking down sadly. You still have me, Issei. Yuma smiled at him, snuggling into him more. Yeah, she'll be back eventually. Kates agreed, clinging onto one of his arms. Yes, I'm sure of it. Asia nodded, shyly leaning against him. Issei smiled at them, hugging the three closer to him. My, my, someone's popular. Akino teased, chuckling. Anyway, any news on the wedding? Issei asked. Nothing good. Rhea sighed used to Issei's eccentricity by now. He's coming by tomorrow after school, which means that your wedding could be as early as this weekend. Issei hummed. Any plans for how to deal with that? I was hoping we'd have enough time for you to train us. She admitted. I could always run away, or maybe fake my own death OH. Do you think you could reincarnate me as an angel so they won't have a reason to marry me off anymore? Uh, no. Issei deadpanned. No, for so many reasons. All of the reasons no. What do you suggest we do? Akino asked as Rias huffed in annoyance. Well, from what you've told me. Issei reasoned. Riser is a massive douchebag. Extraordinarily perverted, has a massive ego, is extremely proud of his heritage, and is willing to use any underhanded methods necessary to get what he wants. Just about. Rias nodded. Besides, he already has a harem. He doesn't want me. He just wants to claim that he's the husband of the Gremry heir. Issei. Yuma asked, turning her head slightly. Are we going to have to compete to prove that you have the better harem? Where would you get that idea from? Issei shouted. Oh, we're just simple trophies to our powerful lord Issei. Kates sarcastically wept. You'd never treat us like trophies, right, master? Asia asked, looking up at him with her big adorable eyes. This is a good thing. This that is going on right now is good. Yahweh nodded approvingly. It's been far too long since I've been adequately entertained. You're all the worst. Issei groaned. Yeah, but you love us anyway. Yuma giggled. Moving on. Issei sighed. So, he's going to be here tomorrow? Should I attend this meeting as well? That could help. Rias hummed. Maybe you could pretend to be my boyfriend? Hmm. That could work. Or you could take my virginity so he wouldn't want Dash. If anyone's taking Issei's virginity, it's going to be me. Yuma interrupted. But he can pretend to be your boyfriend if you want him to. I don't mind renting him, but he gets overbooked, so I'll need a down payment. Wait a second, Dash. Issei tried to protest. Why do you get his virginity? Kates demanded. That's not fair. If anyone gets it, it'll be me. I also double you would L like to. Asia stuttered out, her face catatonically red and her eyes rolling around her head while she entered fantasy land. My virginity is not something to be fought over like the last slice of pizza. Issei exclaimed. Pervert. Kaniko said flatly. How does them arguing over who gets to take my virginity make me a pervert? So, who do you find sexier, Issei? Yuma demanded. 
Which one of us gets to have sex with you first? Yahweh, say something. All right, fine. Yahweh sighed. East says really into innocence. A balance between Shai and Sundra should do the trick. Not too aggressive, but not so passive that it forces him to initiate. You see, the trick is Dash. Why is my life like this? Issei cried. Issei, focus. We need a plan. Rias reminded them. What should I do? Well, considering how weak you all are right now, barring Yuma, Dash, H-E-Y. They all shouted. Ah, Issei. Yuma squealed. I would need a decent amount of time to beat you into shape properly. When I head back to heaven tonight, I'll pull some strings and call in a few favors. I'll need more manpower, since the time I'll need isn't time we have to spare. Once I figure out how strong this riser guy and his peerage is, I'll see what I can do from there. So, does that mean you have a plan? Rias asked hopefully, conveniently forgetting that he called her and her peerage weak. Of course I have a plan, he replied confidently. Don't I always? No. Yuma shook her head. Not really. Kates agreed. I think you're very smart, Issei. Asia told him, skillfully dodging the question. I would say it's more common that you don't have a plan. Why do I talk to any of you? Issei was sitting under the tree in the Garden of Eden with Gabriel. Just Gabriel. It had taken a while, but Issei wanted to spend some time alone with the seraph to thank her for helping him so much. He also needed to figure out how to go about the whole he was God situation. That wouldn't exactly be the easiest thing in the world. It's nice here, don't you think? Gabriel started, leaning her head on his shoulder. Though I'm surprised that Dulio isn't here. You haven't met him yet, have you? Not yet, no. Issei shook his head, putting one of his arms around her. What's he like? He's a wonderful person. Gabriel smiled. Dulio is like the older brother many of us never had. I had three, of course, but Dulio takes on that role for everyone. Well, anyone that has the praise of the great Gabriel is someone worth meeting. Issei teased. Gabriel just giggled. After a long pause, she asked, How do you think you should tell everyone? Honestly? I have no idea. I doubt they'd all accept me anyway. Issei admitted. I mean, for all this time, they believe God is dead and now some kid just comes along claiming to be his next in line. I wouldn't blame them for being skeptical. I suppose that would be the case. Gabriel hummed. But it's not just some kid. It's you. That's what makes it different. I don't get what you mean. What's there not to understand? Your Issei. Just be patient with everyone. Be the person they need to follow and they'll come around. Everyone likes you, Issei. It just comes naturally to you, I guess. He blushed and looked away slightly. I'm just a bit nervous, I guess. I mean, Yahweh was so good at what he did that even Michael struggles. How am I supposed to do any better? Well, you've made it this far. Yahweh pointed out. No point in getting here if you don't go all the way, right? Father makes a good point. Gabriel agreed. You've been waiting for this your whole life. Now you have the opportunity to help bring peace to the three factions to return our God to us, and to do more good for the world than anyone else ever had. Just believe in yourself, Issei. I'm sure you'll do fine. Thanks a lot, Gabriel. That, that really means a lot to me. Of course, Issei. If you ever need a shoulder to lean on, I'll be here. I think you're the one leaning on my shoulder. Issei pointed out. Well, if you didn't like it, you wouldn't have that goofy smile on your face. She replied cheekily. Besides, I don't see how it's my fault your shoulders are so comfy. Point taken. Issei chuckled. What do you think? How should I do it? Well, you could make a big speech. She suggested. You're good at that. Have Michael summon all the angels and just make a speech. That seems rather simple, doesn't it? What did you expect to do, Issei? Some magical treasure hunt that would inevitably lead someone to become the next true successor by holding up some special relic or something? I mean, aside from the treasure hunt, that did kinda happen. Issei noted. I was chosen by some sort of special relic or something which makes me the next true successor. That doesn't change the point I was trying to make. Gabriel sighed. Just be yourself to them. I'm sure they'll appreciate it. I guess I will. The two sat in a comforting silence for another while. Gabriel content to be with someone that was comfortable with and East say glad to be out of the hospital. Lady Gabriel, it's nice to see you here. Came a new voice, approaching the two of them. Issei looked up to see a young man with a gentle smile on his face, his hair blonde and his eyes a sparkling green. And who's this with you? Did you finally decide to take a lover? Dulio! Gabriel squeaked, blushing and hurriedly getting off Issei. No! Ahem. This is Issei Hayadu, so you're the Dulio I've heard so much about. Issei greeted. 
Nice to finally meet you. E say hi to Dilio Jejualdo, Joker of Heaven. Dilio introduced the two shaking hands before Dulio grabbed an apple from the tree and started to snack. So, you're Michael's Jack? Is that right? Not exactly. Issei chuckled sheepishly. I've got my own deck. Oh? Dulio questioned, continuing to munch on his apple without too much of a change of expression. After the last battle of the Great War, Yahweh sealed himself into a sacred gear. That's the one I have, Heavenly Crown. Issei explained. I see. Dulio nodded understandingly. I suppose that means you outrank me, I guess. Issei was beyond confused. He was taking it so casually the fact that Issei held Yahweh's soul within his sacred gear. Not only that, but he believed him. Right away, too. Why aren't you dash, surprised? He asked, finishing the first apple and moving on to another. You're a very powerful angel, Issei. It's not hard to figure out that there's something different about you. I wouldn't have guessed that God still lived on in any form but it isn't outside the realm of possibility. So, you're Heaven's Joker, hm? Yahweh questioned. I am. And you're Yahweh? Dilio replied. I like you already. Titles can be such a bore. I agree. I prefer the simple things. Like sampling the global cuisine. I truly envy you, Dilio. All I can eat in here is memories of food. It's not the same. Yahweh sighed. What did I tell you about eating in my soul? Issei shouted. What brings you here, Dilio? Gabriel inquired. I haven't seen you here as of late. Ah, I was summoned to Canada by the rumors of a wonderful new dish. Dulio sighed in happiness at the memory. Truly wonderful. I thought Canada wasn't real. Issei wondered. Well, I just went there. So it must be. Dulio reasoned. That's not what Ms. Hatcher told us. Issei thought carefully, remembering the lesson. Flashback. And as you can see here. She instructed, pointing at a large graph. This proves that Canada is in fact a fictional place invented by the United States government to convince people to live in their northern sector. Normally it's far too cold, but studies show that incentivizing people with maple syrup can be a strong motivator. Flashback and, yeah, I don't think she's a real teacher. Issei deadpanned. Gabriel giggled at him. Perhaps I should join you in class sometime. As much as I would love to see you more often, don't you have too much to do here? I guess you're right. She sighed but I can dream at least. Do you have any ideas about how we should inform Heaven Dilio? Issei asked, changing the subject back. Perhaps a large speech, though you'll need to provide adequate refreshments. Dilio pondered aloud. Sounds like you have your answer. Gabriel giggled. That just seems rather boring. Issei sighed. I'd rather fight some giant monster and unveil it that way, or make some sort of super divine judgment of awesome righteousness. But that means there has to be a giant monster. Gabriel pointed out. And even if there was, you already did both of those things, remember? First Yuma and then Kokobil. I think you could use a bit of normalcy, Issei. You can be a bit eccentric sometimes. I don't see the problem with that. Issei huffed. It's part of the Issei package. She giggled again. Hope you kept the return address. Yahweh, this is going to be a long day. Issei sighed, staring at the mirror of his bathroom. He had contacted Michael about how soon he could gather all the angels together and, apparently, the answer was the next day. That day was today, which also just happened to be the same day Riser was coming to visit Rius, on top of the fact that he had school. Fridays were normally something to look forward to. This morning had been rather pleasant though. He, Yuma, Asia, and Zenovia had officially moved into the House of Crowns, the girls having moved all his stuff while he was unconscious. Of course, Yuma and Asia decided that they only needed rooms to store stuff in and refused to sleep anywhere but with him. Normally, this practice was something Issei tolerated, but it just felt more right this time. Maybe it was the new living space. Issei finished getting ready and had his morning meal with his fellowship of crowns. Now, he was off to the morning sermon, which Michael had set up as a mandatory meeting for all angels. He would be giving a speech, introducing himself, as God, to all of heaven. Hey Issei? Yuma started. You should really calm down, you know. What makes you say that? Calm? I'm plenty calm. Calmness does not evade me. I embrace the dash. You seem a bit nervous. Asia added quietly. Why would I be nervous? That'd be crazy. Nervous? Not me. I'm only about to give a speech to all of heaven about how I'm supposed to be the successor to the greatest being who has ever lived and expect them to believe me without murdering me, and assuming they believe me and are willing to follow me, which are both far off and unlikely assumptions to make, I then have to lead an entire faction. I'm 17. 
That's perfectly reasonable. So why would I be dash? Shush. Yuma scolded, grabbing his face between her hands as the three walked towards the gathering area so Issei would have a bit more time to relax. You have nothing to be nervous about. You're Issei. Sure you aren't perfect, but what's wrong with that? You're kind, gentle, strong, caring, brilliant, and a wonderful leader. Why yes. Asia quickly agreed. You're a very great friend, and I'm very happy to be following you, but that's just for the dash. No, it's not just for the two of us. Yuma shook her head. What about Zenovia? And Rhea's peerage? And you have Lord Michael and Lady Gabriel's approval. Asia added. So, in conclusion, Yuma spoke professionally, as if giving a great speech herself, before grabbing him again and kissing him deeply before pulling away. We have full faith in you. If you don't have faith in yourself, then our faith would be wasted. Do you not trust us to put our faith in people that can be trusted? W. R. Dash. Asia turned red as Issei shook his head dumbly, his mouth still open in surprise. So, then you should have a little faith in yourself. She winked. Right, Asia? You, um, why yes? She sputtered. Why don't you give Issei a good luck kiss, too, Asia? The blonde just squeaked in response and started to become a stuttering mess. Oh, well. Another time. Ready, Issei? Uh. Issei took a moment but managed to shake off the surprise and process everything. I think so. Good. She smiled. Thank you both. He smiled back and pulled them both in for a hug. Just don't forget about us when you get mobbed by fans. Yuma teased. I love you both. He murmured. Hmm? Yuma asked, faking ignorance. What was that? I didn't hear you. Uh, nothing. He quickly replied, pulling back. Asia was already barely conscious, her face red and eyes spinning around in their sockets. He haved to make my speech no be. He spoke quickly sprouting his wings and teleporting off. Issei. Yuma sighed but quickly started to giggle. I love you too. I'll love. I is Issei. Asia babbled. All right, come on. Let's go. Yuma said, dragging the blonde by her arm to the section of the sermon designated for the crowns. There he stood, a slow drip of sweat from his forehead. Michael had announced that there was special news, which was why this morning's sermon was mandatory, barring extreme emergency circumstances. Then, he brought Issei out. Now, Issei stood in front of every angel in heaven and had to come up with something to say. Er, hello, my name is Issei Hayadu. He started out, slightly nervously. Real smooth, Yahweh commented. Just take a breath and explain everything. You get really into it once you get started. Ah, right. Issei cleared his throat and started. As you are all aware, following the sealing of Drag and Albion, our lord perished, having successfully saved our faction's survival. His loss was painful and difficult for all of us. We were left to grieve our Heavenly Father, Lord Michael was left to run his great systems, and we were all at a loss on how to move forward. Through the bravery and continued efforts of all the angels, we survived and will continue to survive. Good start. Yahweh nodded. Now on to the main point. Unfortunately, that is not the whole truth of the matter. Issei continued, earning gasps and murmurs from the crowd. Although no one knew this, not even Lord Michael or Lady Gabriel. In his final moments, our great lord sealed himself away within a sacred gear himself, intent to be kept imprisoned within a gear for all of eternity. Until now, no one has awakened it. And, my name is Issei Hayadu. The king of crowns released his ten glittering golden wings and activated his sacred gear, replacing his trademark halo with a glowing crown. I am the first wielder of the heavenly crown. Following the abdication by our heavenly father, I intend to follow his footsteps, his teachings, and his guidance and become his true successor. He gave us two cities, wherein I am from one and intend to lead the other. I ask you to follow me as you followed him, to accept me as I learn and grow alongside you, and to continue to spread his teachings of love, forgiveness, kindness, and charity. The boy speaks the truth. Yahweh spoke, earning even more gasps from the crowd. As the wielder of the boosted gear is the red dragon emperor, the wielder of the heavenly crown is the Lord. Issei is the best successor I could have asked for, my children. So, unto my orders, let there be one ruler, one king. And that king is Issei. Hi, who is the mercy of the sky above? Issei started to chant, bathing in the light of heaven. What's he doing? Zenovia exclaimed from the crowd, starting to panic. Wait. Yuma stopped him. It feels different. Let him finish. I agree. Asia nodded timidly. It feels warmer, not scary and powerful like last time. I am the God and the Lord in heaven. Yahweh joined. Should the end come, 
I am but the beginning. Should the dreams wither, I am but the dream. Should the stars burn away, I am but the sun. May my holy path. Issei clasped his hands together and shut his eyes. Embrace you. Yahweh finished. The blinding holy energy that radiated from Issei flashed, forcing the angels to shut their eyes. When they opened again, Issei stood before them. He was much taller, towering over the angels. His hair was blonde instead of its previous brown color, and his eyes were the trademark green of pure blood angels. This is my form. Issei boomed. My form of God. So, will you accept me? The angels stared for a moment until Yuma started clapping. Asia and Zenovia quickly joined her. Soon after, all of the angels were applauding, many shedding tears of joy and shouting, Our Lord has returned! By the Holy Father, we will be saved once more! I always knew if we prayed hard enough, he would return to us! Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, and Uriel joined Issei on stage. Michael directly to his left, Gabriel directly to his right, Raphael slightly to Gabriel's right and Uriel to Michael's left. Many years have come into preparing Issei for his role. Michael explained to the quieting crowd. But we believe he is now ready to take the mantle left by my father and do far greater things than I have ever done. I was but a temporary substitute. Issei is father's true successor. In addition, Uriel stepped slightly forward. We have also provided him with his own brave saint's deck. A new suit was developed, the suit of crowns. As king of crowns, Issei and his saints will continue to grow and prosper in order to protect the heavens. We hope that everyone will come to see him as a leader, Gabriel said. As we all have. The four of us, as well as father, believe that heaven could be entrusted to no greater man. From the short time I've known him, Raphael finished, stepping slightly forward. The praise of my siblings speaks true. I entrust my faith into Lord Issei and his saints, Yuma, Asia, Zenovia. Issei boomed. Please come forward. The three hastily flew in front of Issei and the four great seraphim. Yes, my lord. Yuma Amano, high-class angel. Issei introduced, gesturing for her to bow before the crowd. He introduced each of them before beginning to conclude his speech. I shall endeavor to lead with the grace of my predecessor and lead heaven into the future with a peaceful world. I seek to live in a world where I do not fear for the lives of those I love. Where I can trust that they will be safe without me by their side to shield them from harm where my friendships, trust, and love is not to be restricted by faction or politics. Soon, angels, we will all breathe free and lead the world towards a better future. The vast majority of the angels continued to cheer, applaud, and cry. They were ecstatic for a new leader, a true successor to their fallen lord. He had returned to them and with him in front, they would prosper. That was the most terrifying thing I've ever done. Issei groaned into his pillow trying to milk the last few minutes they had before teleporting to school. But you did amazing! Yuma praised. You were really wonderful. Asia spoke timidly. I have no regrets choosing to follow you. Zenovia nodded. I believe you are worthy of the title of my king. Thank you guys. Issei sighed. But I'm not really one for crowds. That's okay, Issei. It's not like you have to do that every day. Yuma giggled. As long as I have you three with me, I'll be fine. He smiled. Ah, Issei. Yuma cooed, tackling him and snuggling into him. You can't just say stuff like that you know. I have to remind you every so often. He chuckled. Yes, yes you do. She leaned down and kissed him again. If that doesn't make it official, I don't know what does. Yahweh grunted. Eh, he's got a point. Issei shrugged. So, I take it you're into the whole harem thing you've wrapped me into? Only if Asia's second. She grinned and yanked the bright red blonde over too. I'll let myself out. Zenovia said awkwardly her own face relatively pink as she walked out of the room. You'll join us in time, Zenovia. Yuma waved her off. Now, Asia. Did you have something to say to Issei? You and me, I, ISS Issei. She stammered, her face bright red. Honestly, screw it. He shrugged before kissing her as well. Asia squeaked in surprise but did nothing to resist. In fact, she leaned into him slightly. Um, I, I really like you. Asia admitted trying not to faint in embarrassment. I like you too, Asia. I can't imagine what would have happened if I hadn't abducted you that day. He grinned as she giggled slightly. So I guess this is an official thing now. Wow, way to not make that awkward at all. Yahweh drawled. For someone who thinks he's an anime protagonist, you really had to go about starting your harem in the least dramatic way possible, didn't you? Not everything has to be cliche, you know. Issei yelled back, blushing in embarrassment. I'm just glad you're admitting it early. 
That makes you better than those protagonists in my eyes. Yahweh grinned. Now, get to school. You have three minutes until class starts. Chapter 12, CrossFit for Devils. School passed by relatively normally for Issei, albeit Yuma was especially clingy today. And Yuma is always especially clingy, so this was something else. All he could do was sigh in relief when the final bell rang, though. His day was far from over. All right, class. Ms. Hatcher exclaimed in her usual, bubbly manner. Make sure you study for your test on tactics for an invasion of Jerusalem. I think you were right. Yahweh deadpanned. Definitely not a real teacher. No kidding. How has no one else realized that what she's talking about is insane? Issei thought in bewilderment, but continued packing up his stuff. Ready to go, Issei? Yuma asked happily, smiling brightly in front of him. Just about. Asia and Kate's ready as well? I'm ready, Issei. Asia nodded. Sure. Let's go teach that guy a lesson. Kate spoke confidently. Come on, Issei. Yuma giggled and hopped on his back again. Let's go. Don't you ever get tired of being up there? Issei sighed as he made his way out of the classroom, knowing better than to try and get her off. Nope. The group of four continued towards the old schoolhouse building, passing by the crowds of students who were heading home for the day. After a brief walk, they'd arrived outside the door, where they heard several voices. For the last time, Riser, I will not marry you. Rhea's voice frustratedly exclaimed. Ah, but Rhea's darling. A male voice spoke. His voice was very smooth, with a hint of lecherousness to it. We've been over this. Our wedding is coming up just next weekend. Hope we're not interrupting anything. Kates apologized insincerely, opening the door to the clubroom. Kates. Everyone. Good to see everyone. Rias greeted them with relief visible on her face. The great riser rather dislikes being interrupted. Riser said, looking towards the entrance at each of them. He was a tall... Attractive man with blonde hair and dark blue eyes. He wore a fairly stereotypical bad boy outfit, with a button-up shirt that had several buttons undone, exposing his chest. A glint in his eyes nearly sparkled as he eyed each of them, until he got to Issei, in which he glared menacingly. Who is it that makes an appearance in front of the Great Riser? Yo, Grafia, good to see you again. Issei waved, completely ignoring the proud phoenix to greet the gray-haired devil queen that was also in attendance. How's Serzex and Sarah fall? A pleasure to see you again too, Issei. She nodded stoically. Don't you ignore the great Riser. Riser declared angrily. I didn't know people actually spoke about themselves in the third person. Yahweh deadpanned. I thought it was just one of those quirky things they gave to anime characters like Juvia. Issei mentally agreed. This is my knight, Kates. Rias introduced, gesturing to the pink-haired devil. Unlike her usual demeanor, she barely acknowledged the blonde simply glancing at him before looking away. And a few friends of mine. Friends of yours? Riser narrowed his eyes. These so-called friends of yours don't seem like devils. In fact, I'd say they feel more like angels. Issei Hayadu, angel of heaven, how's it going? The heavenly crown host greeted, deciding to at least give the guy a chance. This is Asia Argento Dash. You um, hello? Asia waved uncomfortably. And on my back still for some reason is Yuma Amano. Issei finished rubbing her cheek affectionately. You look exactly like how I thought you would. Yuma giggled, nuzzling Issei's hand. So, my bride-to-be is becoming a traitor, is she? Riser asked angrily, lighting a flame in his hand. Looks like the great Riser will have to burn some feathers. There will be none of that. Grafia ordered sternly. Both Serzex and Seraphal are aware of Issei's presence and are undergoing peaceful negotiations. I will not allow any hostility that will lead to fighting. Well, if it's from the strongest queen in the underworld, even I can't refuse. Riser grumbled, sitting back on the couch. Someone's cranky. Issei snickered, sitting across from the phoenix with Yuma and Asia, while Kates joined up with the rest of Rias Peerage who were all standing agitatedly around Rias, who sat at her desk. Maybe a hawk took his eggs? Yuma suggested, giggling alongside him. Silly Yuma. Fried chickens can't lay eggs. Issei explained. How dare you insult the great Riser? Riser demanded. Oh, relax, Featherbones. He waved him off. It's just some good-natured teasing. So, you're Rhea's infamous fiancé, are you? That I am. Riser grinned smugly. The great Riser Phoenix, third son of the House of Phoenix. Hm. Yuma scrutinized, eyeing him carefully. No, I don't see it. Kates, what about you? Me neither. Kates shook her head. If he gets one, then Issei definitely should. I'm sorry, what are we talking about? Rias asked. I thought you said Riser had a harem? Yuma questioned her. 
There's no way. How dare you question the Great Riser? Riser yelled. Man, you're annoying. The Great Riser this and the Great Riser that. Issei groaned. As much as I'd love to have Yumaskiwa you right here, that would be counterintuitive. Grafia, you no doubt know that I'm here to try to assist Rius, so why don't we cut to the chase? Understood. Grafia nodded. Rius? Issei gestured for her to start. Riser, I'm going to be taking advantage of the stipulation in our contract. If I'm able to beat you in a raiding game, the marriage will be void. Rius announced. You really think you have a chance to defeat me? The great Riser? Riser boasted, almost laughing at her ludicrousy. With this puny peerage? Two knights, a bishop, and a queen? Am I correct to assume that you have a complete peerage? Issei asked. Of course I do. Riser snapped his finger and a large magic circle appeared behind him. After a momentary flash, fifteen figures appeared. Perhaps unsurprisingly, they were all revealed to be female, in varying ages, heights, hair colors, and sizes. So that's how. Yuma exclaimed. That's low. Keites nodded. He was only able to get a harem by being the king of his peerage. Don't talk ill of Lord Riser, snapped one of the girls. She wore a traditional Japanese outfit colored red and white. She carried a large wooden staff with her, and her blue hair was styled into a similar style as a chromosome. Look at those two! Yuma shouted, pointing at two other girls. They have to be elementary schoolers! Pedophile! Hey! One of the green-haired twins protested. We're not elementary schoolers! We're in middle school! The second agreed. So Riser's not a pedophile. That doesn't really help their case. Yahweh commented, No kidding, creepy. Issei agreed, looking at the peerage himself. Wait a minute. Hold on, what's wrong, Issei? Asia asked timidly at Issei's loud exclamation. Even Yuma got slightly worried as her king stood up and walked forward. Mira! Riser ordered, feeling threatened by Issei's actions. Understood. The blue-haired girl with the staff rushed forward, attempting to strike him with the staff only to find herself hanging off her staff by her belt which was now embedded into the wall. Kaya! Issei walked forward to the peerage and carrying, as they took a single step back, awaiting Riser's instructions. That's Eno Dash. Grafia tried to interrupt before a fight broke out. She's so adorable! Issei shouted, sparkles coming out of his eyes as he looked at one of the girls. Even someone like you can find a diamond! So cute! A-R-U-T talking to me? The girl he was looking at choked out, blushing aggressively. She was blonde, with her hair done up into twin, drill-shaped tails on either side of her head. She was wearing a fancy pink dress and stood with regal poise. Well, had been standing with regal poise. Of course. Just look at you. He continued to gush. Of course that's what he was up to. Yuma giggled. Issei. Asia pouted. Aren't I cute enough? Asia. Issei stood as if preparing an important speech. You are the epitome of adorableness. That does not mean adorableness can't be found elsewhere. Just as one can admire many pieces of artwork, one can admire many adorable women on this planet. However, only the ones he truly loves and love him in return shall accompany him home from their artist. Somehow, that made sense and made no sense at the same time. Yahweh scratched his head. I feel like that should be offensive, but maybe flattering? You've lost me. It is truly a great loss that someone of such cuteness has been snatched up by the likes of Riser. Issei sighed in disappointment. Actually, that's Riser's sister. Rias pointed out. He's dating his sister? Issei shouted. Actually, that might be a devil thing. The Bible says that devils are creatures of sin. Yuma piped up. Incest is pretty kinky. Maybe it's common. Enough. Riser roared. You have insulted the great Riser long enough. So what? You heard Rias' proposal and you seem quite confident, don't you? Issei challenged. And to my knowledge, she is allowed outside help, so long as they don't outrank her and she can afford it herself. I assume these stipulations are of no concern? After all, you are far superior to Rius in terms of rating games. She should at least have some chance or it won't be very entertaining, will it? H.N. Riser scoffed. I'm the great Riser Phoenix. She has no chance of defeating me, with or without your help. Just prepare yourself, angel as I don't intend for you to live through the match. Oh, I won't be participating. Issei chuckled. I could never risk hurting someone as cute as she is. What's her name, huh? Oh, please tell me. And my name is Ravel. The sister of Riser squeaked, still completely red-faced. Adorable. Issei awed. We should have expected this. Akino chuckled. No kidding. 
Keite sighed. Issei, focus, Rias protested. Sorry. Issei shook his head and reacquired his bearings. So, as it stands, Rias stands no chance against you. You are almost undefeated, aren't you? The great Riser has never lost a real match. Riser spoke smugly. Then Rias and her peerage will be given ten days to prepare for the game. Grafia decided. Is this acceptable to both parties? I accept the terms. Rias nodded. If you think it will give her a chance. But mark my words. Riser narrowed his eyes at Issei. She will become my bride. Very well. I shall inform Serzex of the arrangement. Grafia nodded, taking herself, Riser, and his peerage back to the underworld. Well, that certainly dash. Issei tried to say, but was interrupted. Hey! What about me? A loud female voice protested from across the room. They turned and realized that the blue-haired girl Riser referred to as Mira was still hanging from her staff on the wall. Get me down! I forgot all about you! Issei exclaimed, jumping up slightly and hurrying over. Naughty Issei! Yuma scolded. Already stealing concubines from Riser? You could have asked me, you know, I already told you. I'm getting his veer dash. Keites tried to argue. That is not what's happening. Issei yelled as Mira started wiggling even more, now more afraid than uncomfortable. Get me down. Even Riser's better than here. Mira protested, desperately trying to get down. Would you hold still? Issei managed to hold her down as he gently extracted her from her position on the wall. There. You're down, Al. She moaned, rubbing her rear end. I didn't know you were a sadist, Issei. Akino licked her lips. I think we'll get along just fine. What do you mean even Riser's better than here? Issei asked, ignoring the sadistic shrine maiden. That's none of your business. She snapped. Now, could somebody help me get home? Hold on a minute. If you aren't happy with Riser, maybe we could help. Yuma volunteered. After all, my boyfriend did kind of give you a mega wedge, boyfriend? Keites yelled. Issei, when were you going to tell me? Now I have to settle for second. You, um, actually. Asia nervously spoke. I double you a second, Issei. Keites glared at him. Get over here. Ah! Issei screamed, bolting out of the clubroom with Keites hot on his heels. Get back here, ISSCI! She shouted after him. Should we dash? Rias asked hesitantly. He'll be fine, probably. Yuma waved her off. So, what's up with Riser? With Keites and Issei. Keites! Stop it! Issei yelled, running full speed through the courtyard. Stop running! She shouted back, catching up and tackling him, making sure he didn't go anywhere by sitting on legs and pinning his arms down. I'm way stronger than her. Why can't I move? Issei thought to himself. Cause she's a woman. Yahweh deadpanned. Duh. Yeah, actually, that makes a lot of sense. Why were you running away? Keites demanded. Because you were chasing me. So? Were you going to tell me that you officially started dating Yuma in Asia? Eventually. It was this morning. I was busy. Issei defended. And? And what? Issei. Are you making me spell this out for you again? You chased me through the courtyard and pinned me to the ground. Issei whined, failing to wriggle out of her grip. The least you could do is tell me. You, R-R-R-R-I-S-C-I, she growled cutely. This isn't some harem anime. You cannot be this dumb. She's got a point. Is, is this because of what happened a few weeks ago? And what did I tell you after that? Oh, yes, oh, Kate smocked. And I have to pin you down to talk to you about it? Hey, in my defense, you shouted and started chasing me. Issei sat up and raised his hands in defense, as she stopped pinning him. How was I supposed to know what this was about? Uh, I don't know, genius. Maybe because I all but directly told you. I don't understand hints. Just tell me and this doesn't have to be all confusing. I want to be with you too. I told you already. I love you. They're happy? I still do. It hasn't changed at all and I still feel like you're worth it, even though you saved me for third. She grumbled at the end, but then looked him back in the eyes. So? I said it. No riddles or woman trickiness that you love to grumble about. I want an answer, even after all I put you through. He sighed. You're sure you don't have a hero complex? If you don't either kiss me or tell me to move on in the next ten seconds. Keites warned. Fine. Issei chuckled. Sure, that wasn't one of the MMPH. Keites was cut off by Issei bringing her closer and kissing her deeply. She quickly wrapped her own arms around him, sighing slightly in happiness. He pulled back after a few seconds so she could catch her breath. Options. I can't say I love you back, but... 
he quickly clarified, determined not to make her upset. I do like you a lot. A lot a lot. You mean more to me than you could know. Hopefully soon, I'll be able to say it back to you. No hesitation or second thoughts. Is that okay with you? That sounds like a challenge. She smirked at him. And one that I'm more than happy to accept. Uh, that's not really Dash. We've got some time before you have to set up the training with Rias, right? I mean, the sooner we start the better, but Dash, then I have some catching up to do. Kates grinned and pinned him back to the ground, keeping him prisoner for the next short while, making absolutely sure that he'd be able to love her back as soon as possible. You look a bit. Rias paused. Ruffled. I didn't expect Kates to take him right out there. Akino chuckled. Pervert. Kaniko deadpanned. Issei. Yuma whined. I thought I was going to be first, for the love of. Issei groaned, sitting down on the couch, his arms being immediately claimed by Yuma and Asia. That didn't happen. I am an angel, you know. I thought you said dash. Yuma tried to ask, but was quickly interrupted. Well, Issei should really be moving on to the training ideas. Yahweh spoke up loudly, definitely not covering up his big secret. Don't you think so, Issei? I should also look to get a new alarm clock. Don't push it. Ah, uh, Issei? Rias looked beyond confused. You're so eccentric. Yuma giggled. All right, rumors and top secret lies spread by the original lord aside. Issei returned the conversation to where it was supposed to go. We should really be discussing training. We have ten days, which should just barely be enough to get you all not to get your asses royally handed to you with a side of fried chicken. Hmm. That sounds tasty. Kates hummed. I'll bet Issei would enjoy that. Akino teased. All of our dash. Moving on. The king of crowns interrupted. Rias, your team will consist of yourself, Akino, Kaniko, Kiba, Kates, Asia, Zenovia, and Yuma. That's eight people. I don't know if you're aware, but that's a lot of people to make not totally pathetic in ten days. No offense. Gee, thanks. Akino rolled her eyes. Kaniko just glared at him. I thought you said I was strong enough. Yuma puffed her cheeks out in annoyance. And you are Yuma. He patted her head. For this, at least. That's why you'll be assisting me with instruction. Yay. Rias, do you have anywhere this training can take place that isn't in the underworld? We own a cabin in the mountains. She suggested. That's originally where we planned to have the games. Perfect. Plenty of forest to train in, I presume? And does it have a sizable body of water in the vicinity? Yes to both of those. She nodded. Whatever you do. Kates warned. Do not give Issei a cup of water. Hey, it worked, didn't it? Issei waved her off. You're exaggerating. I was soaked. So, you really have a plan for this, Issei? Rias asked, once again taking care of the arduous task of keeping everyone on topic. Of course I do. Give me the coordinates of the mountain, and I'll meet everyone there to start training tomorrow. Until then, Yuma and Asia are within your care. I'll send Zenovia here as soon as I get back to heaven. But that means... Yuma immediately put on the cutest pouch she could muster. You'll be sleeping without us. I'd rather stay with you. Asia admitted. For this time, I want you two to get to know Rias' group a little better. And Yuma will help fill me in on anything of importance for my training plan. He explained. It's just one night. You'll both be fine. But Dash, I will wear a blindfold so I don't have to look at your pout. I need you both to stay with Rias. Oh, fine. Yuma relented. Kiss? Troublesome angel. He grumbled, but obliged, bidding the same farewell to Kates and Asia as well. Here they are. Rias handed him a paper so he could teleport to the area the next day. And, you're absolutely sure that we can win? Tell you what, why don't we put a separate wager on this? Issei suggested. I'm listening. If my training fails and you end up losing the raiding game, I'll personally break Yahweh's system to reincarnate you into an angel. He explained. What? Issei. Even you can't do that. Yahweh yelled, I can do whatever I want, I'm God. He waved Yahweh off. Rules are for people that aren't God. Pff waha isay. Yahweh sputtered. Anyway, that doesn't really matter because they're going to win, but I have to offer something of worth just in case. When you inevitably win the raiding game, I want to accompany you and your peerage to the familiar forest. The familiar forest? Kates asked, curiously. Are you aware of what familiars are? Issei asked her, like, in video games and movies and stuff? Exactly. Those are real, too. Issei turned to Yuma. Yuma, you have a familiar, don't you? Of course I do. She grinned, creating a magic circle in front of her. From the magic circle came a bizarre, yet beautiful and mystical creature. 
It was about the size of a golden retriever, coming up to Issei's knees in height, but just over three feet in length. It had a dark blue coat of fur on its limbs and sides, that grew slightly lighter over its chest and stomach. The rest of its body held golden fur, with gorgeous designs. Finally, it had a fluffy, sky-blue mane and tail, plus large tusks coming from its mouth. This is Nadi. Her name means river in Hindi. Wow. Kate breathed in awe. Even Rias and the rest of her peerage gazed at the majestic creature in wonder. The large, cat-like creature purred slightly and snuggled up against Yuma's leg, who giggled and stroked its fur. She's a Yali. It's a creature from Hindu mythology. Part lion, part elephant, and part horse, though she looks more like a saber-toothed tiger to me. That's really impressive, Issei admitted. I expected something more, traditional. Something like this? Rias asked, holding out a hand and summoning her own. From her palm came a very small bat-like creature, with a round body. The top half and wings were black, while the lower half was pink. Yes. That's more what I had in mind. Issei nodded. Those are more traditional familiars. What Yuma has is, well, that's incredibly special. She is, isn't she? Yuma grinned and continued to hug and nuzzle her summoned familiar. Anyway, familiars are traditionally smaller creatures that make packs with other species that are higher on the power scale. Devils are the most common who use them, and tend to do lower level tasks. Sometimes surveillance, sometimes paperwork, and the stronger ones will help in combat. He explained. It gives the summoner an extra set of hands that are extremely loyal and the familiar gets protection, as well as a possible increase in strength, intelligence, or anything else that its summoner gives to them. So, they're like pets? Asia asked curiously, not so subtly trying to pet Yuma's familiar, who quickly picked up on it and introduced the two. In a rough manner of speaking, yes. Familiars are contractual pets, essentially. So, what's the familiar forest? Is that where they all live? Kates asked. I can answer that. Rias volunteered, dismissing her familiar. Yuma kept hers out, as the Yali was more than thrilled with the attention it was receiving from Asia, Yuma, and surprisingly enough, Kaniko, who had come over to investigate. The familiar forest is an area owned by the familiar master. Once every full moon, he allows a group to enter the forest to attempt to make a contract. However, only devils are privy to information about how to get there. Come to think of it, how do you even know about the familiar forest? Oh, I know all sorts of things. He waved her off. So, do we have a deal? I want to know why you want to enter the forest. If you know of its existence, I'm sure you're more than capable of getting one yourself. She questioned suspiciously. I heard a rumor of someone living there that I'd like to meet. He shrugged. And it just so happens that the familiar that I would like will be there next month. Who are you talking about? And what familiar do you want? And how exactly do you know that they'll be there? Rias asked in rapid-fire succession. I told you, I know a lot of things. You mean I tell you a lot of things? Yahweh pointed out. Everyone learns things from somewhere. The point isn't where you get the knowledge from, only that you have it. That's a surprisingly good point. So, you want to meet someone I don't know, in a place only I have access to, before getting a familiar I'm unaware of, that will be there at a time I haven't been told about. Rias sighed. Really? Well, let's put it this way. If I didn't have enough motivation before, I'll definitely have it now. All right, I guess that works. Rhea sighed. If we win, I'll take you. All right. Issei cheered, pumping his fist into the air. Then I'll see you guys tomorrow. Take good care of my saints, will ya? Sure thing, Issei. Rhea smiled. And thank you. For the last time, came the sigh of a tall woman. I've trained you all I can. Besides, you're a fire dragon. You can't train here. I understand that, Lady Tiamat. A deep, draconic voice answered respectfully. But I still wish to follow you. It is my wish to help once again return dragons to greatness, and you are the strongest of the surviving great dragon kings. The only ones more powerful are Great Red and Ophis. So why don't you follow one of them? And leave me alone. Great Red spends his time in the dimensional gap and Ophis is impossible to find, in addition to being emotionless, uncaring, and mentally checked out. The dragon huffed. I suppose when you are alive longer than time itself, that can happen. Why do you still wish to follow me if I can't even train you? Someday, Lady Tiamat, I believe that you will change your mind. Until then, I will continue to aid you in any way I can, whether that be in menial tasks or protecting your captive. Who told you about him? She hissed. I was trained by you, Lady Tiamat. It would be disgraceful for me to fail to sense such a powerful creature from this close, even under seals that you yourself created. 
the dragon replied humbly. Do not worry, I shall reveal his presence to no one, and you expect me to believe you? I know you well, Tiamat. After following you and training under you for a year, I have come to understand you. You will not kill me for simply showing my wish to aid you, TCH. She scoffed. Zai, I still don't understand why you're here. How am I supposed to help revive the dragons? I believe that you should become our queen. The dragon informed her. When you are ready to leave, I will continue to follow you and you shall lead us into the skies. Seriously? I am of the utmost seriousness. You can forget it. Dragons are all but extinct. If you really want to try and keep us alive, go take a make and start fucking. It takes a while to make a new one, you know. The other dragon opened his mouth. That's not me. I wouldn't suggest such a thing, Lady Tiamat. I'm nowhere near your stature. He shook his head. I am but your humble servant. I will follow you. All right, fine. She groaned. But we're leaving in a month, if only temporarily. Something comes by once every century and that happens to be this year. I don't want to be anywhere near it. Something that even you fear, Lady Tiamat? Such a creature must be mighty indeed. The dragon hummed, not for its might alone. It could hardly stand a chance against me. For its influence. Tiamat sighed. Zayakotl, let me tell you a story. The story of the great deer be the... The mountainside was a beautiful place, Rhea's family's land even more so. The trees blew slightly in the wind and the grass shimmered in the early morning sun. In the center of it all was a massive cabin, sturdily and magnificently built. It was more than enough room to fit an even larger group than the one that was to be staying there, had indoor hot springs, a massive kitchen and dining room, and plenty of area for training. All in all, it was the perfect place to just sit back, relax, and enjoy the early morning. All right, everybody. Time to wake up, roared East say through what was likely a magically powered megaphone. No time to waste, should the bird stay in slumber. It shall miss the morning worm. Should the mouse be left to sleep, the winter will come too soon. Yahweh spoke wisely, however, through the magical megaphone. He wasn't really that much quieter. Within five minutes, everyone was outside in their pajamas, half-heartedly trying to rub the sleep out of their eyes. Almost everyone. Where's Yuma? Issei asked, only receiving confused looks and yawns in response. Figures, why do we have to do this so early? Kate grumbled. If you sleep, you don't get to survive. Pretty simple stuff. Akino, Rias, and Asia. You three are on breakfast duty. The rest of you, get ready for training and deal with the aftermath of breakfast when and if you eat. Everyone is to be fully fed, dressed, and ready for training within the next hour and a half. I don't care if you haven't eaten, if you fell back asleep, or if you're but naked in the middle of a shower. In ninety minutes I'm dragging all of you outside and we're training with whatever we've got. Are you insane? That's nowhere near enough time. Rias protested. Think of this as war. On a battlefield, the enemy won't sit there and wait for you to doll yourselves up. Now I suggest you come up with something appropriate quickly, or you'll all go hungry. Not to mention, if I were them, I'd be angry at the one who didn't make the food in time, so chop chop. Realizing the seriousness of going into training unfed and half-dressed if they took too long to eat and get ready, everyone quickly returned inside with only mumbled complaints. If you have time to complain, you'll run out of time to eat. I'm being generous here, he called after them. If this keeps up, I'll keep taking time off. Ninety minutes is more than enough. Don't you think you're being too hard on them? Just because Michael gave you fifteen minutes to dress and eat in the morning doesn't mean you have to use his style. Yahweh pointed out as the trainees rushed inside even fast and Issei walked in after them, set to punish Yuma for not waking up with the others. And war? Really? You've barely been in battles, let alone a war. Don't you think you're overdoing it a bit? Maybe, but I'm training them. What I believe is that you don't know something unless you are capable of teaching it to others. I chose to not allow myself to consider anything mastered in my training unless I was able to teach it to someone in the future, should the situation call for it. Is that why you spent so long on everything? I thought you were just a perfectionist. That'd be why, Issei nodded, opening the door to Yuma's bedroom with an evil grin. Now, if you'll excuse me, oh, I'm excited for this. Yahweh gave a similar devious grin. Yuma. He called softly, kneeling next to her bed and putting his best innocent smile on for her to see when she opened her eyes. Time to wake up, Yuma. Hmm, Issei? She hummed sleepily, slowly fluttering her eyes open, smiling as soon as she saw his face. Good morning, Issei. Good morning, Yuma. Do you know why I'm here? He asked her, a little too sweetly. Um, 
she started to sweat a bit. To, to give me a good morning kiss because you love me so much? Oh, if only that was the case, you my dear. He says sighed before picking her up by a leg and forcing her out of bed, earning a loud yelp of surprise. But unfortunately it isn't. He say. She whined, trying to get out of his hold. Put me down. This is embarrassing. No kidding. Next time I yell for you to wake up. He ordered, dropping her on the ground with a thunk. I expect you to wake up with everyone else. This is training week. Save the lovey-dovey mush for after you've kicked that fried chicken's ass. Is that understood? I'll. Yuma complained. Is that understood? Yes, S-I-R. She quickly sat up and saluted. Good. He helped her up before giving her what she hoped for. Good morning. Now go get ready, or you'll have to train people half-dressed and starving. Right. She whispered, still dazed from his aggressive wake-up call and morning kiss. You got lucky. If this happens again, the sweet half won't happen. He winked before walking out of the room. Well, it looks like you managed to finish in time. Issei nodded approvingly at his line of trainees. If I'm honest with you, I expected one of you to be missing a shirt, one to have the bedhead that I had the pleasure of seeing this morning, and another to have missed breakfast. Good work. Especially you, Zenovia. I suppose the rumors about Griselda weren't exaggerated. You seem rather used to this. You have no idea. The bluenette shivered slightly. If you expected us to not have enough time, why did you give us so little? Kates complained. Because I'd rather prefer it if the people who I consider important to me stay alive and relatively unhurt. He informed them, before smirking. That is, of course, unless I'm the one to hurt you. A groan ran out among the group. PFFF, this is the best. Yahweh laughed. All right. As I said before, there are seven of you I need to make less pathetic. Rias, Aquino, Kaniko, Kiba, Kates, Asia, and Zenovia. Some of you are decent, others not so much. By the time I'm through, you'll stand more than a fighting chance against Riser and his gaggle of girly gamblers. Gamblers? It fits the alliterative theme. He say shot back. Anyway, now it's time for a warm-up. Your stamina is most likely horrible. As cliche as this will sound, I want you all to run. Run as fast or as slow as you want, I don't care. All I care about is that each of you runs along the circle I laid out for you that goes around the entire property, and you complete said circle ten times. Ten times? Several yelled in complaint. He say, the perimeter of this property is a mile. Rias told him. That's a ten-mile run. What's your point? He say shrugged. A ten-minute mile is average for a human, so this should take you under two hours if you were hopeless. I could give you a time limit if you want dash. No, I think it's more than reasonable. But, as they say, a good leader shouldn't ask his subordinates to do anything he isn't willing to do themselves. I have to talk with Yuma about a few things and that should take around twenty minutes. But I think I can probably run this whole thing before you all are done your second time around. Aren't you exaggerating just a little? Kiba asked, slightly warily. I'm a knight, and it would take me at least half an hour to run ten miles, though I would barely be able to move afterward. That's part of the challenge, Issei said, lining up with the rest of them. Everyone will do every bit of training I assign to them, all of which you are more than capable of doing. If you overexert yourself, it'll just hurt worse later. That, or you'll pass out, and end up with less sleep because you'll have to do the training when you wake up. I thought you said you trained with him before. Asia looked at Kates nervously. Is he always like this? Kates just gulped and nodded her head. You have no idea. Issei, what am I supposed to do? Yuma asked. Run as fast as you can until I finish. Then you'll stop and we can chat about what you've learned. Issei told her, stretching a little as he prepared to run. All right, just a reminder, no magic, demonic power, wings, or teleportation. Everyone ready? No. Good. Begin. Issei threw a light magic-encased fist into the ground causing a miniature explosion, signifying the start to the warm-up. Fifteen minutes later, Issei crossed the line for the tenth time, breathing slightly hard. Phew. Now that was a workout. Not really. Yahweh shrugged. Yeah, you've got a point. Issei chuckled as he waited for Yuma to finish her sixth lap, while everyone else was on their fourth. How are you that fast? Yuma asked, breathing harder than Issei, but still relatively composed. Training. He smirked. Now are you gonna stand there, or are you gonna come help your favorite angel torment I mean train some peerage warriors? Maybe I should have looked into this side of you before pledging my undying love. Yuma shivered slightly. Ah, uh, don't be like that. He winked, kissing her on the cheek before tossing her over his shoulder and walking off. You love every part of me. 
It's time to make sure you all survive, Yuma giggled. Yeah, I guess you're right. Well, that certainly took long enough. Issei informed the panting and exhausted trainees in front of him. Ten miles in an hour! Come on, is that it? Issei, do you understand how fast that is? Keitase panted from the ground. That takes, humans, over an hour and a half. All right, point taken. All humans, please raise your hands, Issei requested. Seeing none, it appears your point is invalid, as she grumbled, an effective one. Now, take this opportunity to breathe and or stretch while I explain what you'll be doing. I won't repeat myself, so you'd better listen closely. Issei ordered, snapping his finger to create a large magic circle behind him, summoning several human-shaped figures. I pulled more than a few strings to set this up, so I expect 100% from everyone. Rias, you're in charge, so I expect even more from you. More than 100% is a mathematical impossibility. Yahweh pointed out, yeah? And so is teleporting a bunch of trainers for angels and devils. What's your point? Yahweh did not respond. That's what I thought. That said, Rias, you're up first, right? She nodded tiredly. This was also my biggest favor. I had to pull out the big guns. Your trainer will be Archangel Michael. Issei gestured the blonde man forward. It's good to meet you, Rias. He nodded politely. Lord Michael? Zenovia gasped. Doesn't he have to run heaven? Yuma asked, tilting her head in confusion. I pulled more than a few strings. Issei shrugged. Besides, this is only for today. Right. Anyway. Rias, you're the leader. Your team could outskill theirs tenfold, and you could still lose if you're a bad leader. Good leaders inspire those under them. Good leaders are worthy to follow. Good leaders make good decisions. I want you to be a great leader. So, I gave you the best leader I could think of. The leader of heaven, right? She nodded dumbly. Michael will be molding you into that leader. Scenario and strategy training, how to inspire your followers, what is expected of you, and how to become a powerhouse worthy of being followed. You have a different trainer the rest of the week who will work with you on your strength and stamina, but for today, Michael is training your mind. You need to have the mindset of a leader. That's why Michael is here. And he doesn't mind that dash. That you're a devil? Michael smiled pleasantly. No, my dear. Ever since Issei came around, we've really begun to care less about the faction boundaries. He asked a favor of me, and for such a worthy cause, I would be remiss if I were not to assist you. Well, get going then. Issei barked. You heard him. Michael chuckled. Follow me. Next up. Akino. Issei gestured again. Your trainer for the week, Dulio Jejualdo. Heaven's Joker and the wielder of Zenith Tempest. You're a lighting user. Dulio uses all of the elements. I expect great things. Nice to meet you. Dulio waved, munching on an apple. You ready to do this? I am. She nodded confidently, following him. Kaniko. Brutal little bugger you are. He chuckled at her glare. Hard to find you a good meathead, but I did find one. This is Dima Kuznetsov. The bull yokai, she's small. He spoke in a very bold and harsh accent, likely hailing from a Slavic nation. He was a titan of a man, with massive muscles rippling from his arms, legs, and chest. Dima was dressed in an army uniform with a buzz cut and had a horn coming out from either side of his forehead. This is girl I train? That's her. Issei nodded. She may not look like much, but this little pipsqueak can punch through cement walls. Hm. He hummed gruffly, stroking his chin. Very well. I shall train. Come, small one. Let us make you strong. I'm working with him. She asked flatly. You are. Issei nodded. Dima's from Russia. I met him on a training mission there. He trains the bull yokai. Hell, his name literally means strong fighter. I strongest fighter in all of motherland. Dima announced proudly. So, good luck with him. Kaniko sighed but followed after the monster of a man. It was a little comical, honestly. A short barely five-foot-tall girl being trained by what looked more like a tank in human form. Actually, that's more creepy than comical, but it was what worked for his training. I'm next! Yuma volunteered. I was getting to you. Issei sighed. Zenovia. You're with Yuma. Your strength and skill with a sword is phenomenal. However, you have no angel skills whatsoever, and because of how large your swords are, your speed is abysmal. Oh, it's not that bad. Lighten up a bit, Issei. Yuma scolded. Basically, I'll teach you all the light magic you'll need to know and practice making you fast enough to keep up with the knights from devil peerages. That makes sense. Zenovia nodded. 
Shall we begin? Yep. Yuma happily replied, turning to walk away. Not even gonna say hello? Came another female voice in slight amusement. Griselda? Zenobia shouted in surprise. Good luck with your training. She gave a wave. Don't slack off or I'll have you transferred to me. Yes, ma'am. She saluted and hurried off. Well, there goes that surprise. He sighed. Should have brought you one at a time. Anyway, since you're here already, Griselda is next. Kiba, you're with her. You're a speed demon, yes, but you bruise like an overripe banana. Griselda will toughen you up so you're not quite so squishy. I look forward to working with you. Kiba bowed respectfully and walked forward. You say that now, kid, but I don't expect you to be able to say much of anything by the end of the day. She grinned evilly, leading him off. All right, so Asia and Kates are the only two left. Asia, I think you'll like your trainer a lot. Greetings. Another blonde male walked forward and waved. My name is Raphael. Another archangel? Kates shouted in surprise. Yup. I'm good. Issei grinned darkly. That blonde is as good as fried. Scary. Yahweh shivered. Asia, you're not a fighter. It's a simple fact. I know. She said quietly, looking down sadly. Hey, don't give that look. He walked towards her and crouched down, meeting her gaze and smiling. Being a fighter isn't everything. I don't know if I want you to be a fighter. You're the gentlest and kindest person I've ever met. Fighting is the opposite of that. But if I can't fight, I'm not useful. That's not true at all. That's why you're working with Raphael. You were given a gift by Yahweh's system, the gift of twilight healing. Your healing power rivals the top healers in the world. It's magnificent. Raphael is going to take you to the next level. That's your purpose, Asia. Healing. Helping others. I want you to be even better than you already are and I know you can. You think so? She asked hopefully. I know so, okay? I don't want to see any more self-doubt or worry about how you fit in. I don't put just anyone into my brave saints, you know. I chose you, not to hope you'd be a warrior one day, but because you aren't. Your talents lie outside the front lines. And their job is even more important. I'll do my best. She nodded, having a bit more confidence than before. That's the spirit. Issei ruffled her head lightly and lightly shoved her towards Raphael. Now, go become the healer you can be. We'll head towards the lake. Raphael informed her, leading the blonde alongside him. And last, but certainly not least, Issei turned. Kates, am I with you? No, I'll be around helping everyone throughout the day. He told her. I got you someone more unique. Being owed a favor by the Lord can really influence decisions, you know? Plus, I've been thinking of ideas ever since we started talking about Riser. So, who is it then? That would be me. A new male voice spoke. He was slightly older, appearing to be in his late fifties or early sixties, and he walked with a wooden walking stick. Over his body, he wore red, traditional Japanese robes and loose-fitting green pants, leading to his traditional Japanese sandals. My name is Minamoto no Yoshitsun. Minamoto, Issei continued, was a military leader of the Minamoto clan in the late twelfth century. His immense success caught the attention of the Shinto pantheon, who immortalized him. He is one of the most legendary samurai of all of history, easily fighting off the supernatural with his katana, Dojikiri Yasutsuna, christened as a legendary blade upon slaying Shutendoji, a great ogre general. Wow. Keites breathed out in awe. But why is he so... old? The man chuckled. I'm no longer a fighter, young one. Simply a trainer. I shall do my utmost to make you worthy of using the blade young Issei has told me you wield. Kagurasamaru a personal favorite of mine. Follow his instruction, and you should be in the footsteps of the greats. Issei nodded. Hopefully, this will make up for my lacking in swordsmanship. Now. Get going, come young one. We have much to do. The older man said, walking off into the distance with Keites hurrying in behind him. I love my job. Issei sighed. Chapter 13. Training is a lot of work. Time and place? Well, this is fucking boring. Yahweh mumbled to himself lounging around in the dimensional gap. How do you two stand it? Mather responded. Sounds to me like you try to outbore the boredom. Nice. Yahweh and the two other massive creatures continued to do nothing for a long time. A very long time. If you were to take a single mustard seed and place it in an empty box that was 16 miles long, 16 miles wide, and 16 miles high, and continued to do that once every 100 years, that is how long the three did absolutely nothing. I can't take it anymore. Yahweh shouted. There has to be a point to this. Great Red? Ophis? 
Come on, back me up here. Great Red said nothing, only let out a snort of air, and rolled back over. Empty, Ophis said simply, still not really acknowledging anything. What does empty mean? Yahweh asked. Bah, who cares? We're all powerful, super creatures. We cannot be this bored. I'm going to find something to do. And so, the one-day future lord set out on a journey, across the dimensional gap, alone. He quickly found that there truly was nothing there. It was the dimensional gap. It was an infinitely large plane of absolutely nothing, no one, and non-existence. Entertainment was not present. Hmm, very close, but still incorrect. Michael shook his head. You fail. That's every move I have. What could possibly be left? Rias demanded, frustrated at her repeated failures at something she thought she was pretty good at. Chess, you're failing to see the bigger picture. This isn't exactly an easy puzzle, he explained, returning the pieces to their starting positions. Allow me to demonstrate. Firstly, the queen captures the pawn at h7, checking the black king. That's a queen's sacrifice, Rias exclaimed. Wait, I tried that on my third attempt. You said it's unwise to sacrifice your queen. And what did you do after that? I moved the queen back. She defended. Exactly. Sacrificing your queen is unwise unless you have a very good reason to. You didn't have a good reason. You were simply trying to find out what I wanted you to do. Michael explained. He then went on to begin solving the chess puzzle, explaining each step as he made it. And finally dash. King to d2 revealing a hidden check with a checkmate. Rias breathed out. That's incredible. That's a seven-move force checkmate. Even Sona would be hard-pressed to see that, indeed. Believe it or not, this was a human chess game. Michael chuckled, putting the pieces away. Edward Lasker vs. George Allen Thomas in 1912, a casual game of chess that went down in the history books. I've played, and been handily beaten by, the former in the 1915 New York Masters Tournament. He's an exceptional player. You play chess in human tournaments? She asked in bewilderment. Indeed. In fact, several famous players throughout history have been devils, angels, or fallen angels in disguise. It's a leader's game and one we tend to enjoy. Honestly though, the best players tend to be humans. Perhaps it's how they've survived this long. I had no idea. Rius responded honestly. I knew that it was a good strategy game, but to this level. What I'd like you to see, Rius, is not the board and its pieces, but a commander and his army. Michael explained. They are not one and the same. You see, in the real world, telling your pawn to sacrifice himself is not something every leader will willingly do and even fewer pawns will willingly follow. I'd never sacrifice any of my peerage members like that. Exactly. Therein lies the difference. Chess is a game of mentality and strategy, but they are not one and the same. To be a good leader you must have a good mind, yes, but to be a great leader, you must be a good leader with a good heart. Chess is but one way to practice seeing the forest for more than just the trees, and that, Rias, is why Michael is here today. Issei informed her, walking into the room. Because Michael is a true leader. The best there is. Someone who makes decisions, hard ones and easy ones. Someone who makes mistakes, small ones and big ones. Michael is a person who moves past them all for what he believes is the greater good. While this is a simple rating game, yes, you are the leader of a peerage. The goal is for your presence alone to make them want to follow you. For your mind and your heart. Right now, they follow you because they are your friends or because you saved them. That makes them loyal followers, yes. But can you expect that in the future? Do you expect each of your peerage members to be pure-hearted followers that you lucked out by saving their lives? What if Kates had resented you? I never thought about it before. Rhea submitted, actually showing a slight amount of shame on her face. I was too worried about Riser. I never considered that I wasn't a very good leader. You've done his puzzles, now it's time for mine. I want you to think about the answer to the question I'm about to ask for a minimum duration of the rest of the day. Issei explained. When you believe you know the answer, you may give it to me. You get one guess per day, should you wish to use it. If you get the answer by the final day or before, your training was successful. In addition, only you may answer this riddle. No assistance in any way which means you may not repeat the question to anyone else. What's the question? She asked, determined to get the answer. Two men of equal strength, swordsman A and swordsman B, clash their swords together. Who is the winner? That's the riddle? She blinked. But that's easy. The winner is the one who comes up with the greatest strategy. I told you to take the rest of the day before you answer it. Issei replied, 
his face not changing to hint whether she was right or wrong. For now, I'll leave you with Michael. Time and place? Well, if there's nothing to do, then I'll make something to do. Yahweh declared, having enough of doing absolutely nothing. I can do anything I want. I'm all powerful. I'll just create a place with stuff. Then, whenever I get bored, I can go to the place and interact with all the stuff. And so that's what Yahweh did. He spent a great many years planning how everything would work. He decided that he wouldn't make it too big, but also not too small, only around 46 billion light years before you came back to the other side. After all, he wanted to be able to explore everything without running out of stuff to do, but he also wanted to interact with the stuff soon. Damn it. Also, since this was an experiment, he wanted to make sure it would keep going if he were to leave. After all, his creation shouldn't destroy itself just because he got bored again and wanted to go find something else to do. So, he set up the place to be relatively autonomous. Maybe someone else would come along to check it out. Who knew? Yahweh divided the place up, which he called his universe, into a bunch of sections called galaxies. In each galaxy, he put a bunch of stuff. Each one held different stuff for him to play around with and discover what it did later. For now, though, he just put it there. Once he'd finished filling about three quarters of his universe with stuff, he was visited by Ophis and Great Red, who proceeded to do absolutely nothing. However, this lack of any activity gave Yahweh a brilliant idea. You have excellent control. Dulio praised, nodding his head in approval. The Priestess of Thunder is quite a fitting nickname. Why, thank you. She bowed slightly. However, he continued, you lack a great deal of power. I find that rather strange, seeing as power is practically radiating off of you. You aren't holding back, are you? No, she answered, with a hardly noticeable tint of hesitation. Hm. The Joker hummed for a moment. Very well. There are multiple ways to increase the power you give off. The simplest one would be to simply increase the amount of magic, or in your case demonic energy, that you're putting into the spell. That would weaken my control and drain my reserves faster, so the training would involve strengthening those? She asked him, which is why I don't feel like that training is the correct approach. Your reserves seem more than adequate for your age and skill level and I already mentioned that the control you have is exquisite. We'll have to find a new way to increase your raw power. I have a suggestion. Issei volunteered, emerging from the forest. Akino, how much do you know about physics? The properties of electricity in which your lightning is formed? Not much, she admitted, sticking her tongue out slightly. I would start there. Dilio, why don't you give her an example? Blow up that tree with your eyes. Issei gestured to a nearby tree. Ah. He nodded, following his train of thought. The Joker activated his zenith tempest, and a short time later, the tree exploded from the center, shattering with a loud explosive noise. Oddly enough, however, there was no smoke, nor evidence of magical residue being used. Simply the parts of the tree that were shattered in the explosion. Now your hint is that Dilio used ice magic. Issei began. How did he make the tree explode? Well, she thought for a moment. All trees have sap, right? He froze the sap inside of the tree, and that made the tree explode because, when liquid freezes, it expands. The sap's expansion exceeded what the tree could handle and it shattered under the pressure. Very well done, Issei praised. Exactly correct. What I'd like you to better understand is the physical properties behind electricity, electromagnetism, diffusion, power, and charge. All concepts centered around physics and chemistry. I understand what Dilio did, but how is that going to help me? Akino asked. Just knowing how the lighting works isn't going to increase how strong it is. True, but it will allow you to maximize its effectiveness. Here's an example, he explained. The equation for electrical power is voltage multiplied by current. The current is measured by a change in the electrical charge divided by how long it takes for that change to occur. In other words, to increase your power you have to increase your voltage and your current. Your voltage is primarily based on your demonic energy. More energy input results in a higher voltage, which is why the attack is stronger. It does not, however, affect the electrical current. How do I increase the electrical current? She asked him. Well, for starters, you read this. He tossed her a physics textbook. But, as a basic answer, I'll cede you to Dulio. Because current is affected by charge and time, there are two ways to increase your current. The first, and easiest way, would be to increase the change in charge. Electrical charge is how the matter interacts with the electromagnetic field. Dulio began to explain the basic principles of electricity to the priestess. Now that I'm really looking at her, Issei narrowed his eyes slightly. I'm getting a fallen vibe from her. 
How about you? MMMHMM. Yahweh nodded. Not one of mine, though. She's also an evil piece, and I don't think those work on angels of any kind. They are polar opposites, after all, so, in all likelihood, she's a hybrid, Issei mused. Strange. She's never mentioned it before. Half-breeds are often embarrassed of their origins. Perhaps that has something to do with it. Yahweh guessed. Talk to Yuma about it. If she does indeed have some issues with her fallen angel side, Yuma should be able to understand. Yak now, when you have a good idea, you really have a good idea. You just said the same thing twice, and yet I'm insulted. Too easy. Time and place? There is a chance that if I had too much stuff, I'll just get bored of it. Yahweh thought aloud, stroking his beard in thought. Aha! I'll fill the rest of it with the opposite of stuff. So that's what Yahweh did. The last quarter of his creation was filled with the opposite of stuff. What does that mean, you ask? Who fucking knows? Yahweh does, but he won't tell us, because he hasn't gotten bored of the stuff yet. Until he does, the opposite of stuff will remain a secret. Now with the universe filled with stuff, and the opposite of stuff, Yahweh decided to go through and check everything out. It was very pretty, he quickly realized, and he was full of pride in his creation. He spent a very long time interacting with all the stuff he'd created. A very long time. If you took all the sand particles at the bottom of the Ganges River and counted them, attributing each sand particle to 100 years, that would be a waste of time. But it would also give you a rough idea of how long Yahweh spent playing with all his stuff. Until, once again, I'm bored. Yahweh groaned, sitting on the ground in the dimensional gap once more. And I've only explored about half of my universe. It's all too similar. Maybe I should make a new one. Great Red snorted very loudly and then flew off, doing several flips along the way. Well, that's new. Red was bored. Ophis said simply, So was I. Yahweh exclaimed, relieved that someone else shared in his pain. Wait. This gives me a brilliant idea. Hit harder. Dima roared loudly. You call that punch? I call that flick from Angry Toad. I'm trying. Kaneko yelled back punching even harder. Dima not amused by little girl. Punch, Aya! Kaneko roared. I feel as though I'm not needed here. Issei shivered, quickly leaving the area. Happy place, happy place. Yahweh mumbled, terrified that the naturally quiet young girl was now in a screaming match with a large Russian. Never go back, never. You're getting the hang of it. Yuma nodded approvingly. Just try to dash. What's wrong? Zenovia asked, stopping her attempt at making a light spear when Yuma paused and turned her head, seeming to be looking for something in the forest. Issei! Yuma squealed, taking off and tackling something that was hiding in a tree down onto the ground. Oof! Issei grunted, hitting the ground from Yuma's super effective snuggle attack. Ow dot! Ah, it didn't hurt that bad. Yuma giggled, sitting up on top of him. Whatcha doing here? I came to check up on you too. He sighed, sitting up and pinching her cheek. And it seems like you're not training Zenovia. I am too. She pouted. I just noticed you were here. So, how are you coming along, Zenovia? Issei asked, choosing to ignore Yuma for the time being. I'm not sure. She admitted. I can't quite get the light to stay in form for very long. Hmm. Issei hummed for a moment. Have you tried forming it around an object first? What? Zenovia looked confused. If you're having trouble with its structural integrity, you can find an object shaped relatively similarly such as a branch or an actual spear, and pour your light magic around it, using the object as a mold. Won't whatever object I use get destroyed? Not if you don't want it to. Light magic is largely intent-based. If you practice with it, it will do what you want it to, allotting it follows the allowances of the power, of course. So, if I just will it to not destroy this. Zenovia questioned, having broken a large branch of a nearby tree. It won't get destroyed? Not if Yuma taught you correctly. He replied, poking Yuma in the stomach, causing her to let out another giggle. If it does get destroyed, go back to the basics and try again. Zenovia shut her eyes, gripping the large stick tightly, as light slowly started to surround it. She's doing it! Yuma exclaimed. That's much better than earlier. Wow. Zenovia seemed impressed. This is much easier. True, but that should just help you with the basics. Once you understand how to keep it in its shape dash... Issei was cut off by a slight popping noise as the light dissipated. The king chuckled momentarily before continuing. Then go back to trying to make it without having to use a medium. I understand. Zenovia nodded, before attempting the exercise once more. So, we have some time to ourselves then. Right, Issei dot. Yuma purred, 
looking him in the eyes. Almost, he replied back, in a similar tone. You have time to yourself. I've gotta go. Why ye say? Yuma whined. Nope. He shook his head, giving her a quick kiss before standing and walking away. I've got other people to see and you have plenty more to teach Zenovia. You can never get too strong, you know. Fine. She huffed. I expect extra cuddles ye say. You always expect that. He waved as he set off. Good luck. Time and place? Armed with his new idea, Yahweh once again returned to his universe, starting in the next galaxy that he hadn't explored yet. That was where he decided that he needed to make stuff that could be sentient. If there was nothing to do and no one to talk to, he'd just make something to do and someone to talk to. Why didn't he think of that sooner? Yahweh spent many more years setting this galaxy up how he wanted it, modifying all his rules slightly so that the sentient things could be comfortable. After that, he picked up one of his creations where he decided they would live, which was really just a giant ball of rock he mashed together, he started filling it with what he called living stuff. It was different from his usual stuff, but also the same. It wouldn't be any fun, he decided, if he were to just create living stuff, so he decided to make living stuff out of the stuff he already had. Now this is entertainment, Yahweh thought, as his creations began to begin their existence. It really wasn't entertaining, considering all he really made were things so small he could barely see them even after shrinking down to his minimum size. But considering how long he'd been alive with nothing to do, it was certainly a step in the right direction. Looks like Kiba's up next, Issei said to himself, walking towards the blonde. I wonder how their dash, H H H H, screamed a voice from across the forest. That all you got, blondie? roared a second voice, one he recognized as Griselda. That's barely a scratch. You can hardly see the bone at all. Somebody save me! The first voice screamed again. Issei stopped his walking, turned around, and walked away, whistling a tune softly to himself. On second thought, I think Griselda may be insulted if I showed up. I wouldn't want her to think I didn't trust her or anything. Chicken! Yahweh snicked. So if you were in my place, you'd head over there and check it out? That's what I thought. Whatever. Seeing as Griselda had, ahem, everything under control, Issei decided that he'd go see Asia next. So, he walked over to the lake, set on doing whatever he could do help his adorable little Asia become the best healer in heaven. Very good. Raphael praised. You're doing an excellent job. See if you can focus that same amount of power into a larger area. Okay. She struggled out, feeling the stress of the technique. I think I can get it. Ah, the green light she'd been steadily expanding suddenly popped, shoving her backwards slightly with a loud yelp of surprise. Instead of hitting the ground, however, she found herself in a pair of very warm and very strong arms. That's quite some power you put behind that. Issei chuckled, sitting down with Asia on his lap as Raphael walked over to the two. What are you working on? Twilight healing shouldn't explode like that. Um, Raphael told me there was more the sacred gear could do than just one person's injuries. Asia admitted shyly, her face red from the attention she was getting. Oh? He seemed surprised, looking up at Raphael. What else can it do? In its base form, the only other thing it can do is work over mid-range distances and increase its potency. Raphael admitted. However, its balance breaker is something else entirely. We're working on general magical ability and control so she can improve both together. A very good idea for the first day. I probably just would have had her practice using it as long as possible and work on her agility. He admitted. Anything else in mind? You're way better at explaining this than I am. So, honestly, I don't think I have much else to do here. As a matter of fact, yes. Since she is so new to magical power, I don't believe she'll be able to master the balance breaker anytime soon. He admitted, Asia looking down in disappointment in response. However, I'd like to teach her some defensive abilities in order to protect herself. Very good idea. He nodded before turning to Asia. Hey, don't get down on yourself, all right? Balance breakers aren't something you learn overnight. I know, I just dash. Nope. No buts. He interrupted, hushing her. Do you know how long it took me to get mine? A year. A full year of dedicated balance breaker training just to activate it. Most people never even get theirs, okay? I just don't want to be the only one who doesn't get any stronger. Asia admitted sadly. And you won't be, because you'll get a lot stronger. He reassured her, hugging her tightly to his chest. Raphael is the best of the best, and you'll be better than ever after the ten days are up, alright? You just need to be confident in yourself. You're my adorable five. If I didn't have full faith in you, I wouldn't have added you to my deck, 
and I definitely wouldn't have asked you to play in the rating game for Rius, all right? So, trust me. You're amazing now, and you're only going to keep getting better. He's quite right, you know. Raphael nodded in agreement. I've only known one Twilight healing user better than yourself. No one else has gotten to your level, and you have plenty of room to continue growing, especially if you plan to focus on healing arts as a priority. All right, if you're sure. I'll do my best, that's my girl. He praised, giving her a quick kiss on the cheek before standing and setting her back on her feet. Oh, also, Raphael? I suggest wards over barriers. Probably more her style. Hmm. He hummed for a moment. Wards? Asia asked curiously. He'll explain when the time comes. Issei replied. I agree with you. Raphael nodded. Wards do seem more her style. When we finish with the magic exercises, I'll go over everything about wards and barriers. Good luck, Asia. Issei waved as he headed back into the forest. I'll do my best, she said to herself again, trying to psych herself up even more. For Rias and Issei, time and place? Unfortunately, Yahweh quickly realized that he wanted to do other things for a while, because all the stuff he made he set up to do its own thing, and he was quickly getting bored again. I know! I'll make a new living thing to watch everything for me! Yahweh declared and got to work. This, he decided, was his masterpiece. Better than the other silly things he'd made, like a giant statue of great red made out of some of the stuff he'd created, or a machine that made his beard liquid. This was a brilliant creation. What he'd created was a large deer, nearly three times larger than any of the deer that would come to be several hundred million years in the future. Its antlers were massive and adorned with earthly trappings, symbolisms of life, nature, and beauty. They were golden, green, brown, and shimmering with light. The hoofs of his creation were powerful, yet graceful. Capable of leveling the ground, yet delicate when walking. Its fur was brown and soft, with a fluffy, white underbelly, and a short tail. Its eyes shimmered with the green that he decided would be the color of this place. I'll call you be the... Yahweh decided, naming his creation. Father? The creature blinked at him in confusion, though it did not move its mouth in the slightest. What? Where? Why? And who am I? You can talk? Yahweh exclaimed. Well, telepathically, but still. I must be even more impressive than I thought. So, you created me? Be asked. We have much to discuss. A short while later, Yahweh had given Be the all of his instructions. So I am Be the. The creature nodded. And those are my tasks? Very well. I hope you return one day. Don't worry about that. I'll see you eventually. When you do, please come here. To this land? I shall return every one hundred years. Be the told him. And I will hope that one day, you will return to me. Sounds like a plan, Be the. Yahweh gave the mighty deer a thumbs up. See you around. Your strikes are honest, but they are not true. The old man lectured, as he attempted to correct the pinquette. That doesn't make any sense. Keitase protested. Those mean the exact same thing. They do not. Minamoto replied sharply. Honest strikes are accurate and strong, while true strikes are precise and powerful. Those are still the same. All right, Katsi, calm yourself. Issei chuckled, coming out and putting a comforting hand on her shoulder. He's trying to help. Are you sure he's a legendary swordsman, Issei? She turned to him and sighed, groaning into his shoulder in frustration. He can hear you, you know. Sorry. She mumbled, her cheeks slightly pink. It is of no consequence. The elderly trainer waved her off. I understand your frustrations, however. In order to get stronger, you must overcome those frustrations. How good would you say Keitase is now? Issei asked. She is exquisitely mediocre. He answered honestly. Ugh. Keitase groaned again. However, the possessor of such a powerful sword is destined for greatness, if they are willing to put in the work. I agree. Issei nodded. You were the star of the Kindo Club, Keitase. What happened to all that drive to get better? Where's your motivation? I'm honestly a little disappointed. I am motivated. She said back defiantly. Really? It doesn't seem to me like you're trying very hard. He taunted, egging her on. I-S-S-E-I. She shouted, shoving him away from her. What the hell is your problem? Hey, the Ktes I know wouldn't give up so easily. He shrugged. Issei. She growled, clutching her sword tightly. I'm not giving up. Are you sure about that? Sure looks like it. This is the worst idea you've had, in a very long time. Yahweh groaned. Nah, it'll be fine. He waved him off. I-S-S-E-I. She shouted, charging at him with her sword. Hiya, clang. Issei managed to deflect it with a powerful light sword engaging the pinquette in a sword-based duel. He shoved her backward, 
swinging at her midsection with a quick swipe, which she backstepped, before coming in with a thrust. Issei jumped out of the way, swinging at her center of mass again, beginning a rapid series of strikes met with blocks and parries. Hmm. Hummed Minamoto, stroking his beard. Interesting. The two met in a blade lock, each trying to overpower the other. See? You don't seem to be putting much effort in at all. Issei taunted again. Screw you, Issei! Keite shouted again, shoving her weight into the sword to break the lock. She then went on the offensive, rapidly swinging her sword in various angles, each only being met with blocks. After a nearly successful hit that Issei was forced to jump back from, Keite tried to utilize her knight's speed to get behind him, which he quickly spun around and blocked. Following up with his block, she fainted, allowing Issei to go for a counterattack. Noticing this, she dodged to the side and slammed her sword down on his light sword, causing Issei to lose his grip. Now with her opponent disarmed, Keite's quickly held the tip of her sword to his throat. Who's giving up now? Keite's panted, tired from the five-minute bout. Amazing! Issei praised, grinning widely. You did absolutely amazing, huh? She lowered her sword, tilting her head in confusion allowing Issei to rush in and give her a life-squeezing hug. You did so much better than you usually do, he praised, spinning the pinquette around. Sure, I wasn't really using my full strength, but you disarmed me in only five minutes. Last time, you could only beat me if I wasn't using any angel strength. Very well done, Minamoto praised, approaching the two as Issei set the confused girl down. Your strikes were fast and true. Many mistakes were made, yes but that allows many lessons to teach. You didn't really believe I'd think you'd given up, right? He smirked teasingly. I was just riling up that fire of yours so you'd quit whining about it. Issei. She whined, pouting. That was mean. I thought you were serious. Hey, of course I wasn't. I believe in you fully. I wouldn't get you shits and no Minamoto as a trainer for just anybody you know. He winked at her. Just listen to him, okay? Trust that he knows what he's talking about. Use your head and if you still don't understand something, you can always ask me about it later. I'll do the best I can to help you, but I believe Minamoto is all you need. If you really think so. She sighed and then looked at him hesitantly. Just, don't do that again, okay? I really, I really thought you didn't believe in me anymore. I'm really sorry. He apologized, hugging her lightly. I just needed that fire back in you. You were frustrated because you didn't understand and I didn't want you to lose hope. I know you'll be a brilliant swordswoman. I have full faith in you and that will never ever change. I hope you won't forget that, but I am sorry. You better be. She hummed, returning the hug. I should get going. You've got training to do and I need to work a few things out. He pulled away. Do your best, okay? I know you'll do amazing. I will. She nodded before giving him a deep kiss. Thank you. Looks like you're all still alive. Issei praised the various trainees and trainers that had just returned to the estate. Good job. My brain hurts. Akino groaned, rubbing her forehead. It wasn't too bad, Rhea said, shrugging. A lot of work, sure, but I think it could have been worse. Speak for yourself. Kaneko deadpanned between pants, vaping laid out fully on the ground. Seriously. Keitase agreed, sore and out of breath herself. Issei, why didn't you warn us? Asia asked breathlessly. Raphael had to help me walk back. Look at it this way. Issei shrugged. At least you aren't Kiba. Kill me. Kiba croaked from the floor, looking more dead than alive as everyone turned to look at him. He's exaggerating. Griselda scoffed. No. Zenobia shivered in her own memories, causing most of the others to gulp in fear of the swords using angel. Well. Issei clapped his hands together. I guess it's time for us to eat and then get to bed. I believe Michael. Dulio, Griselda, and Raphael have to get back to heaven and will be back tomorrow, while Dima and Minamoto will be joining us. Dima very hungry. Dima nodded. I appreciate your hospitality, Lady Rias. Minamoto bowed. Yuma will start dinner, but in the meantime, some of you look like you could use help. He chuckled, looking at the various trainees groaning in pain. Rias, why don't you take care of Kaneko and Kiba while I help Asia and Keitase? I can do that. She nodded, moving to help her blonde knight move off his place on the ground, which was oddly surrounded by a damp, red substance. Strange, we're off. Michael informed them, waving at the group alongside the rest of the heavenly residents. I won't be returning tomorrow, however, everyone else will be here. Until next time, make sure you survive the night, Griselda ordered. I look forward to working with you again tomorrow. Dulio smiled and crunched into another apple. You did wonderful, Asia. 
Raphael praised. Be prepared for tomorrow and get enough rest. With their farewells given, the group teleported back to the sky, as Issei gently lifted Asia in one arm and Keites in the other. Akino, why don't you show Minamoto and Dima to their rooms? All right. She sighed, trying to rub the headache away. Please come with me. Sleep important to Dima. Dima grunted, following the priestess. You know I'm spoiling you two to death, don't you? Issei chuckled as he walked away. You're both more than capable of walking. What's your point? Keites teased, poking him while Asia just blushed and looked away. Just that you should be very grateful that I'm so good to you both. He sarcastically boasted. I'm kind of the best. Oh, sure you are. She rolled her eyes. And that's why you got Kiba to train under Griselda. What's wrong with her anyway? You make a compelling argument. He chuckled, opening the door to the girl's room. She's just a training freak. It's her forte. Well, thanks for not giving her to me, I guess. You're very welcome. He replied, setting the two down on a bed before sitting between them and hugging them both to his sides. We'll beat Riser. I know we will. We'll kick that poultry asshole into next week, Kate said confidently, snuggling into his warmth. Easily. I believe we'll win, too, Asia added, slightly nervously. Issei, Yuma exclaimed, running into the room and tackling him for herself. You left me out. You were supposed to be starting dinner. He pointed out from underneath her. I did that, but you weren't there, she huffed. You were taking too long. I can't have Kate or Asia getting your virginity before me. After all, this again. Issei groaned. The group had finally prepared and eaten their meal, Minamoto and Dima retiring for the room for the night, while the girls, Issei, and Kiba decided to visit the bathhouse before they went to sleep themselves. Before she was able to leave, however, Issei stopped Yuma. Hold on a second, he said, grabbing her hand lightly. Naughty Issei! She giggled. Did you want to join the bath with us? Ooh, or maybe you wanted to do something else while they took a bath. Hmm? No. I mean, I would wait, no. He shook his head as she continued to giggle. That's not what I wanted to ask you. I wanted to know if you could do something for me. What is it? I want you to talk to Akino. That's it. What for? She asked him, confused. She's a half-breed, he admitted. And I think she's upset about that. I can't say for certain, but she should be even stronger than she already is. But she's holding herself back. It's not exactly uncommon for people to be embarrassed about being a half-breed, so I thought that might be it. So you thought I'd be able to relate to her because of my situation? I did. You're great to talk to, so I was hoping you could try. If there really is something wrong with her, I'll try my best to help. She declared confidently. No one should have to suffer because of what they are. Yuma. He smiled sadly, bringing her into a tight hug. I'll do whatever I can. She whispered to him, returning the gesture. I love you, Yuma. He told her, I love you too, Issei. She murmured, internally squealing. Finally, Chapter 14, Games and Gains. You've all overcome many hurdles to get where you are today, Issei began. It was the morning of the raiding game against Riser, and the combatants were all waiting in the ORC club room for Grafia's arrival, which would signify the start of the game. You were, for the most part, quite mediocre before we began. Hopefully, these ten days have shown you that strength is an outcome of the work you put into it. Not everything can be gained from birth or status alone. In other words, Yuma giggled from her place on his back. He's proud of all the work you've done. I was getting there. He sighed. Sure you were. She winked. Rias, you've grown into a suitable leader though it took you quite a while. Flashback. So, it's the ninth day. Finally have the correct answer? Issei asked, an eyebrow raised. So far, the crimson-haired girl had gotten farther away from the correct answer almost every day. She had one answer that he actually approved of, which was that her first answer was correct and he just wanted her to be confident. But, unfortunately, that wasn't right either. I think no, I do. I finally figured it out. Rias nodded confidently. The answer is the fighter with the stronger conviction. Explain. Both fighters are equally matched in strength, which is a vague description, though it's vague intentionally. She explained. It sets up several plausible theories, such as the better weapon, the better strategy, or the better prepared. However, each of those can fall under the description of strength, strength of arms, strength of mind, and strength of tactics. And would the same not hold true to the strength of conviction? Conviction is different. Conviction is not something to be trained, sharpened, or practiced like you would swordsmanship or tactics. While it can dull over time, it is not something that is strength directly. Conviction is your will to fight, 
Your purpose for continuing to stand when you fall to the floor. In other words, Issei nodded approvingly. Sometimes the strongest weapon you can have is to stay true to your convictions. Just as the blade is an extension of your mind, so too is your conviction to the blade. That was your final test, Rius. You've passed all the others with flying colors. While you did cut this a little close, and I'd hoped you'd have gotten the right answer sooner, you did get it in the end. I believe you have what it takes to defeat Riser. I do. She agreed confidently. Flashback end. Kaneko, frankly, you still freak me out a little bit. He admitted. Go to hell. She deadpanned. If you'll have me, I'd love to visit. He chuckled. However, you made some of the most substantial progress of anyone here. I'd probably still beat you in a fight. However, it wouldn't surprise me in the least if you were physically stronger than me by a significant amount. I'd get to praise Zenovia. Yuma wriggled in excitement. I think you did great. You're so much faster and stronger now. Plus, you can use all those light weapons against the army of the FCO. The what? Zenovia asked. Dona's dash. Issei tried to stop her, but it was too late. The fried chicken overlord. The evil mastermind of all fried chicken, who preys on the weak. With his mighty army MMPH. Mmm, that's enough. Issei sighed, covering her mouth with his hand as she whined about being denied the opportunity to describe the brilliant fantasy of her foe. Kiba and Keites. You've both made immense progress in your swordsmanship. Kiba, I significantly doubt that any form of physical pain or mental torment will have any effect on you now. She's tough, but Gree Dash. Don't say that name! Kiba shouted, shivering before regaining his composure. Ahem. Thank you for your praise, Issei. I appreciate all the training you've given us, right? The whole group looked at him in pity, having seen the aftermath of his training with her who shall not be named. Ahem, Keites, your training with Minamoto has worked brilliantly. You may be the most well-rounded of the entire group. While your strength is ellipsed by Zenovia, and your speed by Kiba, you have a jack-of-all-trades ability that fits in brilliantly. I did my best with the old man. Keites huffed. Geezer kept speaking in riddles. Asia, you did magnificent work with Raphael. I'm incredibly proud of you. I'm sure you'll rival him in your healing talents in no time, wouldn't you say? Issei winked. I don't know about that. Asia blushed, smiling shyly. But I'll do my best, finally, Akino. I'd say you made the most progress of anyone here, wouldn't you agree, Yuma? He turned his head to smile at the angel on his back. Yep. She nodded, grinning brightly. Thank you. Akino smiled as well gazing at the two in fond appreciation, thinking back on the training week she'd experienced. Flashback. Hey, Akino? Yuma asked, entering the bath next to the Lightning Empress, catching her by her lonesome. Could we talk for a sec? What's on your mind? Come to get seduction advice? Akino chuckled teasingly. How very daring. Do you really have some? She gasped hopefully. Wait. No, that's not what I wanted to talk about. Ahem. I wanted to ask you about your powers. Really? What about them? Well, er, how should I put this? Yuma scratched her head nervously before taking a deep breath and taking a different approach. You know, I wasn't always an angel. I didn't know that. Akino looked surprised. But I don't know what that has to do with my powers. I was born as an angel. She clarified. But I fell, along with the Grigori. I see. It was a really hard time for me. Yuma admitted sadly telling Akino the story of how she fell. How afraid she was for what she'd done, it being the first time she took a life. And even though she lived through the Great War, it never made the regret of that first time go away. How she felt alone within the Grigori, petrified that people would discover what she'd done and hate her for it. You must really hate fallen angels then. Akino smiled sadly, looking elsewhere trying not to lose her composure at having another person hate her for what she really is. Not at all. Yuma shook her head, surprising the half-breed. I can't hate them. It isn't really their fault, after all. It was my own mistake, and I was too afraid to try to do anything about it. Besides, while they weren't exactly nice or friendly to me, at least I had a place to live and work. Oh, I just, I wanted to say I can understand a little bit of what you're going through. Yuma admitted. I know, that you're a half-fallen angel. How did you dash? Issei told me. He can tell and I think Dulio can too. She explained. He's worried, you know, that you're denying a part of yourself or that you're ashamed of what you are. I want no part of those filthy creatures. Akino seethed, trying not to explode. And he shouldn't care whether I do or don't. Whether you accept them is different than whether you accept yourself. 
The angel told her, giving her a comforting hand on her shoulder. You're holding yourself back because you hate that part of you. Is there any way you could tell me why you hate it so much? It's because of my father. She snapped back. He's a fallen angel, a cadre. But he let my mother die. She was just a human. Because of him, my home looked down on us. My clan hated us. And my mother was killed. Because he didn't save her. Yuma was silent for a moment, thinking about what Akino had said before she spoke up. And do you hate him for this? Of course I do. My mother is dead. She was murdered because he didn't save her. He wasn't even there to try. I see. Yuma was quiet again, thinking about how to continue. When I first met Issei, I was on a mission to kill him, you know? That was my assignment, just like Cal Warner did to Keitase. Akino seemed surprised but didn't respond. It's true. I asked him out on a date so he'd lower his guard so I could kill him. It was the best time I'd ever had. I hadn't been that happy since before I fell. She smiled, looking down slightly with a blush on her cheeks. Afterwards, I took him to the park. I was trying to use my name as sort of a cruel joke, you know? Heaven's evening days. Maybe it'd be easier to kill him? Maybe if I acted evil it would be. That's what I thought, anyway. But, he gave me this necklace before I could do it. Akino looked at the angel's hand, where she'd summoned the necklace Issei had given to her. A silver chain piece of jewelry, the ornament being a small heart with two angel wings coming off of it. That's beautiful. It's the most precious gift I've ever been given. Yuma spoke softly a single tear welling up in her eyes. I just broke down. I knew that I couldn't do it. He was just too nice, too innocent. Of course, he knew the whole time. That I needed to do something to him, and that I was hesitating. So, I told him everything. And he listened, and he let me cry on his shoulder while he held me. I just felt warm and safe. Is that why you're always so attached to him? Akino asked. Yeah, I just love that feeling, of feeling warm. Safe. And loved. She blushed, thinking of how Issei had finally admitted that he did. But after that, he broke the system. The entire system that the previous god had set up. He just decided that it was in the way and broke through it. He did what? Akino asked, a moment of disbelief taking over the somber and serious mood of their discussion. Yep. Yuma giggled. There's a system for forgiving angels who have fallen, but Issei decided it was in the way and broke it. It did kill me in the process, but he resurrected me as his ten afterward. Akino just seemed flabbergasted. I guess I got a little sidetracked, Yuma admitted, chuckling nervously. But my point is that it doesn't really matter what you are, you know? I was a fallen angel trying to kill him, but he didn't even care. He just wanted to help me before I fell the rest of the way. If you hate the fallen angels, regardless of the reason, that's fine. Just don't let them hold you back, you know? You have to accept the parts of you that you don't like in order to keep going forward. Our situations are totally different. Akino shook her head. I can't just dash. You're right, they are different. In your case, someone failed to keep your trust. In mine, I murdered two fallen angels in cold blood. Neither deserved to die, but I still killed them. Do you hate me? No, that's not dash. Then you shouldn't hate the fallen angels as a species. Yuma shook her head. I don't know your father. I don't know who he was or what his intentions are, whether he let your mother die or whether he hates himself for letting it happen. What I do know is that you're blocking yourself because you're assigning blame to a part of yourself, because you think that you indirectly caused your mother's death because you're half-fallen. That simply isn't true. Akino was quiet for a moment, looking down and not saying a word. You, you really think so? I do. Yuma nodded, standing to get out of the bath. So, think about it. Try to move forward. If not for yourself, do it for Rias. And if not for Rias, do it for your mother. With that statement, Yuma walked off, set to show a certain angel just exactly how much she loved him. In the days that followed, Akino continued to think about what Yuma had taught her, while Dulio continued to help her make vast strides with her lightning magic. She still hadn't fully embraced it, but she did some basic training to add the holy element into her lightning, trying not to let the past overshadow her future any more than it already had. Flashback end. Unfortunately, this is where my help comes to an end. Issei finished his speech and set Yuma on the ground, hugging her to his side instead. Rias? It's all down to you now. Good luck and give him hell. Right. Rias nodded confidently, watching as Issei gave a final rub to Yuma's head before teleporting off, presumably somewhere to watch the games. This would be so much easier if Issei could fight. Yuma sighed, lying down on the couch, 
awaiting the game to come. We don't have that luxury. Rhea shook her head. Besides, if Issei could have fought, no way we would have done all that training. Keitase added, smirking. I'll bet I could take on all of those jerks. Don't get ahead of yourself. Rhea chuckled. Just because we're all stronger doesn't mean this is going to be easy, by any means. Rhea is right. Akino nodded. Remember, Riser has already participated in ten raiding games, and he's never been defeated. Are you really sure we can do this? Asia asked timidly. We'll own that bozo. Kaneko replied flatly. Well said. Yuma cheered. After a short while longer of waiting, a large gray magic circle arrived, summoning Grafia Lucifuge herself to the Occult Research Club building. Grafia. Rias greeted. Does this mean it's time? Yes it is, my lady. Grafia bowed politely. If you will all step this way, you'll be summoned to the battlefield. However, there's one final thing before we go. Rias, you must give your stand-ins their respective peace assignments in accordance with their power levels. You have remaining. One bishop, one rook, and eight pawns to assign between Miss Asia Argento, Miss Yuma Amano, and Miss Zenovia Corda. I suppose Asia should be the bishop since she's a healer. Rias decided. And Zenovia can be the rook. That leaves Yuma as a pawn. Miss Amano will take up half of your pawn pieces. Grafia nodded. But that assignment is acceptable. Good luck in your games. Rias thanked her family maid, putting on a face of determination as she and her raiding game group got teleported away into the new space. I think something went wrong. Yuma noted, looking around after the teleportation ended. Is it because we're angels? We didn't go anywhere. I thought you said the game was taking place in some super cool dimensional space or something? Keitase agreed, just as confused. Fortunately, however, their questions were to be answered by the very maid that had just teleported them. Your attention, please. Her voice spoke, echoing throughout the air, similar to an intercom. Welcome, everyone. My name is Grafia. I'm a servant of the House of Gremory. I will be your referee during today's match. To create the battlefield you'll be competing in, I took suggestions from both Lady Rias and Lord Riser. You may recognize this place as it's an exact replica of Co Academy, an educational institute in the human world. Each team has been given an area that will serve as its home base. Lady Rias, your crew will be in the Occult Research Club headquarters in the old schoolhouse. Lord Riser's home base will be located in the principal's office in the new schoolhouse. Pawns will be promoted if they can make their way to the home base of the opposing team. Good luck to all. You have ten minutes to prepare. I guess that explains this then. Yuma commented, looking out the now-opened window of the building. Explains what will you H? Keites exclaimed looking at what Yuma was seeing. Instead of the normal sky they expected to see, it was a dark area, filled with glowing green lights, reminiscent of an aurora. As I told you before, Rias explained, the raiding games take place in an alternate space, created specifically for the game that is to be played. That means that we have no restrictions for damage. Akino chuckled. We can even burn it to the ground if we want to. Is that safe? Asia asked worriedly. When someone is defeated in a raiding game, they are immediately transported to a top-notch medical facility, significantly lowering the risk of any fatalities. Anything short of an instant kill should be healed without issue, even the loss of limbs or puncturing of vital organs. The Gremory King reassured. For now, we need to formulate our plan of attack. Here you go, President. Akino brought over to Rias' desk a layout of the school grounds. Rias scanned the layout of the grounds, using the analytical training she'd had over the past ten days to attempt to develop a reasonable strategy. Utilizing Kiba's speed, we could have him lead a contingent of swordsmen through the baseball and football fields along their left flank as our primary method of attack. However, this leaves the right side wide open, the center underprotected, and they can be spotted out from a large distance. A direct confrontation would be suicidal, as we have fewer members than they do. They could easily surround us. Akino volunteered. But we can't just hole up here. Yuma added. If we were to play the defensive game, they could easily use a long-range area of effect attack to take most of us out at once while we're dealing with the frontal attack. We'd be too cornered to escape it, which leaves one primary method. Rias nodded. We'll have to split our forces into attacking key points, while also keeping our strongholds safe. Kiba, Kaneko, and Akino. The three of you will fill the woods with traps and illusions, respectively. Make it as difficult as possible for the opposing pawns to find our base and promote. Understood, President. Kiba nodded in approval, while Kaneko summoned her familiar, Shiro, to assist with the trap laying. We're allowed to summon our familiars? Yuma asked in surprise. Yes, what exactly does yours do? Rias asked, 
inquisitively. Nadi does all sorts of things, the angel replied proudly, summoning her yali to her side. Don't you, Nadi? You're so adorable. Just look at you, the large, majestic creature purred and nuzzled the gushing Yuma. Well, you can't say she and Issei aren't a perfect match. Akino chuckled. Go ahead and finish your plan, Rias, and I'll have Nadi help whoever needs it the most. Although, I'd rather have her stay with me. She grumbled. Very well. Rias nodded, continuing. Once all the traps and illusions are laid, Kiba, I want you to watch over the forest. Finish off anyone that gets caught in the trap and protect the school building. Akino, you'll return here while Kaneko will begin making her way towards the gymnasium from the left flank. Got it. Kaneko replied in her usual flat tone. Asia, I want you to stay close to me. As our only source of healing and recovery, it's important that you're well protected. Um, okay. She nodded. That leaves Keites, Zenovia, and Yuma. The crimson-haired Gremory thought for another moment, deciding how she wanted to continue the assault. Keites, I want you and Yuma to go straight to the gymnasium as fast as possible. It's the centermost position on the battlefield, so it's your job to lock it down for us. Piece of cake! Keites exclaimed confidently. Aye, sir! Yuma saluted, emulating her favorite blue kitten. Zenovia, I would leave you to split the forest with Kiba. But since you aren't the one laying the traps, it runs the risk of you accidentally activating them. Sending too large a force to the gymnasium right away could make them commit harder than we can fight against or cause them to retreat prematurely, either of which we want. For now, take the right flank of the gym. Cut off any exits and assist Yuma and Keites if they need it. Make sure the enemy does not provide reinforcements nor can they escape to regroup. Understood. Zenovia nodded. Your ten minutes of preparation time has expired. The raiding game has now begun, Grafia announced, signifying the start of the fight for Rias' freedom. All right, go, Rias ordered, the trap layers quickly leaving and the assault forces making their final preparations. Yuma, what about Nadi? Well, since you have so much defense here, she doesn't really need to guard our base, Yuma thought. That means she can come with me. Yay, Nadi, the large cat purred, nuzzling its owner affectionately. Very well. Good luck and be careful. We'll be able to communicate with each other using a standard communication circle. Make sure you listen for any further instructions. I understand. You ready to go, Keites? Yuma turned to the pinquette. We have an army of fried chicken soldiers to slay. Let's do this. She nodded confidently, the two high-fiving before setting off. Please. Rias thought, looking out the window nervously. Be careful. Here we are. Yuma declared waltzing into the gymnasium with more of a laissez-faire attitude than even Keites expected. I wonder what the big bad chicken has prepared for us. What about you, Natty? You're just so adorable. You realize this is a battle, right? Keites deadpanned, looking at the angel taking plenty of time to smother her familiar with affection. It's no big deal. This'll be easy. She waved off the pinquette. Is that so? Challenged a different female voice from across the gym. And you think that despite having only brought two members to the centermost point of battle? Your king is a fool to undervalue such a place. Truly. Agreed another female voice. Hi. Yuma greeted. My name's Yuma and this is Nadi. The Yali made a slight noise of greeting. Why are you being so friendly? They're the enemy. Keite scolded. So? We can at least be nice to them before I skewer them. Yuma giggled back. Aren't you the cocky one? Mused the first voice as she led a small contingent of five girls forward. She wore a traditional Chinese chipao with white ribbons in her black hair. My name is Xiuolan, Lord Riser's Rook, Cirrus, the second introduced. Cirrus had on red shorts, a white top that looked similar to Xiuolan's chipao, armored gauntlets and boots that went up to her knees, and wore her long dark hair in a high ponytail, splitting into five thin strands. Lord Riser's Knight. Oh, it's Mira. Hi, Mira. Yuma waved, noticing the next girl in line. Good to see you again. No, it isn't. Mira protested. I'll defeat you here and make up for my embarrassment in front of Lord Riser. Aren't those two next to her the little girls Riser is into? Pedalt. Keites whispered, though intentionally loud enough that everyone could hear. We're not little girls. The first protested. Yeah. We're almost as old as you. Lord Riser's not a pedo. The second agreed. They both looked practically identical each having shoulder-length green hair and wearing a gym outfit. Strangely enough, they also each wielded a chainsaw. Lilikon then. Anyway, why are you using chainsaws? Yuma asked, 
bringing up the obvious question. Besides the fact that you're too young, aren't you devils? Don't you have magic or something? That doesn't matter. Just because we're not very good dash, I'll... Nell! Xuelan snapped. Enough. We've finished our introductions and are wasting time. There are only two of them and that hideous walrus cat. I'll take Dash. I'm sorry, did you say hideous walrus cat? Yuma smiled a little too sweetly, exuding a terrifying aura. I don't think I heard you correctly. What's it to you? You shouldn't bring your pet to a fight, replied simply. I'll Nell and Cirrus, you three take the pink-haired one. Mira and I will take the one with the cat. Kates, I'm going to have to butcher this Chinese girl now. The angel informed her pink-haired comrade. Please deal with the children and the stoic one. Scary, Kates shivered. Right. Are you ready, Nadi? Yuma turned to her familiar. We have a battle to win. The Yali growled aggressively and grew in size, growing double in both height and length. Its claws drew out slightly as well, their razor-sharp edges gleaning in the gym light. The familiar licked its fangs, knowingly intimidating its opponents. H.N. Chiuelan grunted in annoyance. Ready for this, Mira? Yes. The pawn answered, though her tone showed little to no confidence. Well then, let's have some fun. Yuma giggled and spread her wings, shooting forward towards the Chinese rook, her yali trailing close behind. While the preliminary attack force was making their way towards the gym, Kiba, Akino, Kaniko, and her familiar, Shiro, were out in the forest surrounding the old schoolhouse with traps. Akino had also summoned her familiar, which was a small green troll with peculiar-looking black facial features. It split into four separate entities, each looking similar to the original. However, they were all different colors— and spread throughout the forest, each turning into an exact replica of the building. Shiro was jumping from tree branch to tree branch setting motion-activated traps that would launch high-speed magical arrowheads at anyone who crossed over them, while Kiba began to construct a magical barrier. Their goal was to bait the enemy with illusions and arrowhead traps into one of several different barriers. That way, Kiba could approach and eliminate them with relatively little difficulty. They continued this process for some time, until Grafia's voice came on again announcing the results of the first conflict. Earlier, after leaving the ORC building, Issei decided to make a quick stop to invite a certain someone to watch the games with him, in addition to the training group that would already be watching. Arriving at Heaven's Gates and greeting Peter, he flew through First Heaven, heading towards the elevator. Seeing as how it was now public knowledge that he was technically the Lord, he received a great many praises, greetings, prayers, people bowing or kneeling in respect, and every other sort of gesture you could imagine. How do you deal with this all the time? Issei asked Yahweh, mentally squirming at all the superfluous gestures of hierarchical respect. Didn't this make you, like, really uncomfortable? You're forgetting, Issei. Yahweh clarified. That I made the entire world. Before the world, I had no one to talk to, so this was normal for me. That's really pathetic. Shut up. I made the whole world. Be grateful. All right, all right, calm down, crybaby. Brat, Issei continued up the stories of heaven, stopping on the sixth floor, the home of the seraphim. They would have invited him to live there too, but the four of them figured he'd be happier with the rest of his brave saints. It definitely wasn't because Yuma and possibly Asia would have broken the rules and gone to sixth heaven every night just to sleep with Issei. Definitely not that. Making the short trip to a small, but fancy, cottage, Issei knocked on the door, waiting for the recipient to answer. Is that you, Michael? Called the voice from inside walking towards the door to open it. Do you have a message that needs Issei? Gabriel, good to see you. Issei smiled at the blonde seraphim. Issei, you haven't visited me in forever. Gabriel smiled brightly, quickly greeting the angel with a hug before inviting him in. I was starting to think you'd gotten sick of me. Not quite, you're gonna have to work quite a bit harder if you want me gone. Issei chuckled, following her inside. Really? And I was looking forward to it too. She teased back leading the two of them to a couch, where they sat next to each other, Gabriel deliberately as close to Issei as possible. So, what business brings my lord to visit me of all people? In a good mood today, are we? Of course. You're visiting me. She smiled at him. But really, what are you visiting for? I thought that you were still working on training with that Gremry group. I'm still upset you didn't ask me to come help you know. I would have. It's just that your skill set didn't really fit anyone. He scratched his head nervously. Not that you don't have an amazing skill set. I mean, you're Gabriel. You could probably teach anything. I was just trying to match people specifically and I had Yuma there to teach what I would have had you do and I didn't want to get another Seraphim involved since you're all so busy. Because I'd already gotten Dash. Issei. Gabriel giggled. 
I was just teasing you. I know if you needed my help you would have asked me. Right. He exhaled. Dodged a bullet there. Damn right you did. Yahweh grumbled disapprovingly. But out. I'm protecting my daughter. Whatever. So? Gabriel gestured for him to get to why he was there. Unless you're just here to see me, which I'm perfectly okay with. Close, actually. Issei nodded, not missing her big smile at that comment. I wanted to know if you would come to watch the raiding game with me and all the others that helped with training. Well, almost all of them. Dima had to go back to Russia and Minamoto to the Shinto shrines, but Griselda, Michael, Raphael, Dulio, and I are all going to watch together. I thought maybe you'd like to join me? Are you asking me out on a date? She grinned slyly. You're not the first to ask, you know, and here I thought pride was a sin. Issei poked her cheek teasingly. But sure, I guess you could say it is, even though there will be a bunch of other people there, one of which is Griselda and one of which is Michael. They can be mood killers. There shouldn't even be a mood to kill, to begin with. Yahweh grumbled. Gabriel giggled. I thought you said you approved, father? Approval and enjoyment of my host seducing my daughter are very different. I'm not seducing anyone. Issei protested. I just asked her to watch the game with me. Oh, sure. Yahweh wept. First it's just the games and then it's all sorts of things and then my beautiful Gabriel is gone forever. You're overreacting. Issei deadpanned as Gabriel continued to giggle. Sure, I'd love to watch it. Are we going now? Yeah, it should start pretty soon. He nodded. Everyone's down in the House of Crowns lounge waiting for it to start. Ready to go? Yep. She smiled at him, taking his hand as they walked towards the elevator. Curse you, Issei. Yahweh cried. Chapter 15 Ash to Ashes So, what's up with Riser? That was the question Yuma had asked her after she was freed from her spot dangling on the wall. Riser had ordered her to attack Issei, the male angel, and he ended up throwing her to the side where she ended up dangling from the wall by her staff. Not exactly a pleasant place to land. That's none of your business. Mira answered her, still a little sore from dangling for so long. Are you going to help me get home or not? Considering you're a member of Riser's peerage, we don't have an obligation to return you. Rias pointed out. Don't freak the girl out, Rias. Yuma scolded. I just want to know what she means. Riser's not abusive or anything, is he? No, she protested. It's not really any of your business. Well, he is Rias' fiancé. The angel reasoned. And I'm going to be helping her fight you, so that makes it my business, doesn't it? Not even a little bit. Maybe we should have some tea while Rias contacts someone to come pick you up. Akino suggested. Perfect. And in exchange, you can tell us what's wrong with Riser. Yuma nodded her head as if a perfectly reasonable solution had been found. So I'm a hostage? Hostage is a really strong word. I would say a forced acquaintance. That makes me feel much better. Mira sighed. Fine. Rias? Think you can make her arrangements? Yuma asked the Gremory girl who nodded in response. Good. Now, it's not really that big of a deal. Mira rubbed her arm uncomfortably. I just, I really hate being there. Okay. He's a self-centered, perverted, irritating, dishabag and I just wanna, I just wanna. Arf, well it could have been worse. Akino sighed, beginning to hand out tea for everyone. I told you it was none of your business. I just... Mira sighed. He is all of those things, but I want to be of some use to him. He gave me a chance and has led all of us to a great standing in raiding games, you know? But everyone knows I'm the weakest the cannon fodder. Even those two little girls are stronger than me. I'm not sure I get it. Yuma admitted. Why do you want to be useful to him if you hate him so much? Wouldn't you rather get traded elsewhere? Maybe, she admitted. But the Phoenix is our great clan with a wide reputation. My dream is to become a powerful and respected devil in the raiding games. Riser gave me that chance so I at least owe him that much. How often does Riser train with you? Akino asked. That's the other thing. He doesn't. He never trains. Riser says it's beneath a high-class devil of noble birth, or some nonsense like that. Mira rolled her eyes. He could use a good lesson pounded into him. But I'm not strong enough for him to really notice me, especially when he realized I wasn't interested in being another one of his concubines. He has plenty of those, trust me. Oh my! Akino chuckled. Ooh, gossip! Tell me more! Yuma exclaimed. Well, Yubaluna is his favorite. Burent and Marion are probably tied for second, she reasoned. Though he seems taken with Sharia's exotic style dash, could we please talk about something else? Asia squeaked out, her face an atomic level of red. You're no fun. 
the dark-haired angel whined. Fine. So if all you need is for us to beat a lesson into Riser, that sounds doable. Right, Rius? Hold on, I never asked Dash. As a byproduct of winning my freedom, I'll gladly do so with your sake in mind as well. Rius smiled. Also, Grafia will be here to pick you up shortly. I didn't finish. I can't just have you dash. That settles it. Guess we'll have to fight it out on the battlefield then. Yuma said happily. Well then, let's have some fun, ha! Huh? Shiolan gave out a war grunt, charging up her arms, legs, feet, and hands with increased demonic power. Mira took a defensive stance with her staff, albeit a nervous one. Yuma quickly gained a height advantage and began plummeting towards them in a dizzying spiral, a spear of light already summoned in each hand. Nadi began to charge forth as well, eager to help her summoner in the conflict. Quickly realizing that a block attempt for such a fast and powerful attack would prove futile, the Chinese rook quickly dodged by leaping a distance backwards. Yuma quickly corrected her flight pattern by spreading her wings, halting her descent and making a beeline for the rook once more. It's no fun if you run away like that. Yuma pouted, reaching the rook and taking the first swing with her light spear from her right hand. Shiolan sidestepped the blow and tried to retaliate with a powerful kick to Yuma's side which was caught by the angel's other hand, having dispelled the second light spear. Not quite. Yuma smiled, throwing the girl across the gym towards the battle that was taking place with her dear Nadi. What the hell is this? Mira thought as the giant thing ran towards her. Thankfully Yuma was going after Shuelan and not her. However, that left her to deal with this. Nadi growled and attempted to sweat the young girl, having arrived at her of a similar time that Yuma reached Shuelan. Mira, being significantly less experienced, attempted to block the paw with her bow staff, which quickly shattered, causing the paw to impact her and send her flying across the room. Gah! The oxygen in Myra's lungs shot out as she collided heavily with the wall, a noticeable crater being left there. After a brief moment, she was released from the wall and fell on the ground in a heap, seriously feeling the impact, but not willing to give up just yet. That hurt like hell. But this is the only training I'm going to get, so I have to use it. If Riser throws me out, I'll never reach my goal. Shortly after, the form of Xiuolan hit the wall next to her, having reached a similar fate to the pawn by being swatted into the wall by the giant cat. Mira, you can't block Nadi with a stick like that. Yuma informed her, alighting down on the ground in front of the two. You have to dodge her or have a stronger weapon to block. Nadi, dear, hold up your paw for me, would you? The Yali made a slight noise of confusion, but gently lifted her paw and held it near Yuma, who gently put her hands on it and began explaining why what Mira did was foolish. You see these claws? If Nadi wanted to, she could have slashed you right open. And her legs? All this is muscle in this form. Muscle and magical power together form a hell of a powerful hit. You can't block that with a piece of wood, even with a bit of demonic energy in it. The amount you'd have to use wouldn't make it worth it. You have to get a stronger staff or something made of a different material, or there's no way you could block it. Why are you lecturing us? Xiuolan asked, her tone a mix of frustration and pain as she stood and regained her battle stance. Mira was standing as well, looking far more confident than her rook ally though, at the same time, holding an underdeveloped stance, as her weapon of choice was now splinters on the battlefield. I'm not lecturing, I'm helping Mira. Yuma explained. She wants to be a great warrior in the raiding games, but you never do any training. I figured I could give her a few pointers. Your help is appreciated but I told you it was none of your business. Mira protested. Well, if you don't want my help, Yuma mused. I guess Nadi can finish you off. I will not back down so easily. I fight for Lord Riser. Shuelun replied, her false confidence really not helping her look any better. Right. Yuma giggled. You're fighting for a man trying to force a woman to marry him. Okay. Nadi? Knock them out, please. The said Yali growled again and leapt forward, striking down Mira within two swipes before turning to Shuelun. The rook put up a valiant effort, dodging several of the large cat beast's swipes and landing a return blow on its snout. Unfortunately for Xiolan, the summoned creature didn't appreciate such a gesture, and proceeded to impale the Chinese rook on one of its massive tusks, quickly causing her to be transported out in the same blue light that Mira had been taken from. Meanwhile, Keites had summoned her Kagarasa Maru and was preparing herself for her own fight. Opposing her were Aula and Nell, each wielding their own chainsaw, and Cirrus, drawing her Zweihander and preparing for the fight. Nothing to say? Keites asked, drawing the katana from its sheath. Normally people talk about their convictions before a fight like this one. I am Lord Riser's knight. I fight the battles that he wishes me to fight. Cyrus replied simply, 
brandishing her sword. We're just gonna chop you up. Al exclaimed excitedly, revving up her chainsaw. Yep, yep. Nell agreed, copying the first actions. All right then. If you have nothing else to say, let's begin. With her declaration complete, Kates quickly rushed forward, attempting to outpace Cirrus. Their night speed should be evenly matched, however. Considering the size of the phoenix's weapon, Kates figured she could move fast enough to outmaneuver her. Cirrus raised her tsvihander to block Kates first strike, quickly shoving the katana backwards and going for a counter-strike. Kates avoided the swing and began her assault, trying to outpace the opposing knight with her speed. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough as Cirrus was repeatedly able to deflect her blows, though she was unable to safely counterattack because of the onslaught of blows. Don't forget it's not just her. I'll exclaimed, jumping towards Kate's exposed left. We're gonna cut you to pieces. Nell cheered, copying her twin's actions from Kate's right. Kate's broke the blade lock with Cirrus, jumping back to avoid the twins, who immediately started chasing after her again. First dance, Weeping Willow. Embodying that of a simple willow in the wind, Kate's elegantly dodged, blocked, or parried each attack given by the twins, their chainsaws unable to pierce or even damage her sacred gear. Stop moving and let us cut you to pieces. Al shouted. Yeah. Nell agreed. Kates didn't respond. She simply moved with a continued elegance and grace, taking her time, before spotting gaps in the frustrated twins' defenses. Quickly taking advantage of this, she parried one twin's chainsaw, ducking under the other before jabbing her katana through the first middle, almost immediately forcing the pawn out of the fight. I'll. Nell screamed. Unfortunately, this lapse in concentration would be her downfall as a quick slash from Kates into the young girl's side caused her to vanish in defeat as well. Three of Lord Riser's pawns and one of Lord Riser's rooks have been defeated. Grafia's voice announced. Looks like you're just about finished here. Yuma commented, walking up to the two opposing knights, Cirrus still holding her rather stoic look. Think you can handle her? No problem. Kates smirked, preparing to go after the knight. It seems I'm outnumbered. Cirrus grumbled, eyeing her three opponents. I suppose it's best if I make a tactical retreat. Hey, wait a second. Yuma complained, as Cirrus turned and quickly attempted to escape. Kates, go after her. I'll lock down the gym. Right. Kates nodded, quickly dashing after the escaping phoenix. I feel like I'm forgetting something. Yuma thought aloud, stroking the once again pet-sized Jolly's fur. Boom. A loud explosion rang out from the direction that the phoenix knight had run. Debris and smoke spreading throughout the air in a thick cloud. One of Lord Riser's knights has been defeated. Grafia announced. Oh, now I remember. Yuma realized as two forms approached her. Zenovia! I forgot you were our perimeter guard. Good to see you two were successful. Zenovia nodded in greeting, resting her Excalibur destruction over her shoulder. Has the gym been officially cleared? Aye, sir. Yuma saluted sarcastically. All enemy parties defeated. Good. I guess I'll contact Rius. Isn't Kaneko supposed to be here soon? Kates asked, summoning a communication circle for Rius. She should be after the traps are finished. Zenovia told her. Kates? I take it the fighting went well? Rius' voice spoke from the circle. Yep. Jim's all locked down, President. Awaiting further orders. Great job, you three. Kaneko should be there shortly. Sit tight until she reaches you and then we'll make our next move. Roger that, President. Kates answered, dispelling the circle afterwards. So, we just hold here for a bit. I guess so. Keep your nose out, Natty. If anyone shows up other than Kaneko, sick em. The Yali meowed in approval, continuing to rub against Yuma. You're so adorable. Yuma gushed, snuggling into her summons fur. Good grief. Zenovia sighed. They really do disappoint me. Riser mused, continuing his ministrations with his queen's assets. Shall I go clean up there and the mess, my lord? Yubelina moaned back. Please do, my dear, he replied with a devilish smirk. Show those whelps from Gremry no mercy. My he. Carla mine. Another, more feminine voice snapped. Come with me. We'll meet and I and Lee to clean up the rest. Those fools think they can mess with the immortal phoenix, as you command, Lady Ravel. Maya High bowed in response. She held a very traditional Japanese appearance, wearing a kimono with various patterns of purple, orange, and pink. Her long black hair was done up with ribbons on either side, and she was very soft-spoken. As long as there's at least one worthy opponent left for me. Carla Mine grinned. She wore armored attire, crossing between a European knight and a Japanese samurai, 
a white ribbon on her forehead which sat in front of her boyish short brown hair, and wielded a large broadsword. I suppose I should oversee the action as well. Riser sighed. She could at least make it a challenge for me, having already received the results of the battle with Yuma's brigade, Kiba, Kaneko, and Akino went their separate ways, Akino returning to Rias, Kaneko meeting up with the gymnasium group, and Kiba set to patrol the first, keeping an eye out for anyone looking to invade their base. Fortunately, or perhaps unfortunately, Kiba didn't have to wait too long before he detected some of the traps being triggered. A distance away from where Kiba currently was, was a small contingent of four members of Riser's peerage. They had tripped just one trap so far, though weren't all that impressed by its effectiveness. Do they seriously think this is enough to get us? Marion asked. One of Riser's pawns, the woman wore a French maid's outfit to accompany her shoulder-length light brown hair. I know they were pathetic, but this is just sad, agreed Burent. She wore an identical outfit to Marion, however. Her hair was darker, with a reddish tint to it. Don't be foolish, warned a third woman. She was clearly the toughest of the group and the leader. On the right side of her face was a white mask, which she wore alongside a long-sleeved black jacket with its midriff ripped off, matching jeans that had the right leg ripped off, and thigh-high boots. This is obviously some sort of trap or diversion. Keep looking for their base and do not set off any more traps. Don't you think you're overthinking things just a little bit, Isabella? The final woman giggled. Her name was Sharia and she was easily the most exotic of the bunch. Her skin was darker, rather than the pale white of the rest of the group and she wore a dark metallic bikini with various other jeweled trappings along her body. Her long, pale blue hair hung down to the middle of her back while the front framed her face, stopping just above her purple highlighted eyes. This is why Lord Riser ordered me to assist you, Isabella scolded. You're all simple-minded. Traps like these aren't meant to take out your enemy. They're meant to be a diversionary tactic. Well, whatever. Marion huffed, slightly peeved at the rook's attitude. Let's just find their base so burent, Sharia and I can be promoted. Agreeing with her statement, the three pawns ran off through the forest, pursued by an exhausted rook that felt more like a babysitter than a warrior. Honestly, those simple-minded fools, why would Lord Riser recruit them, even as pawns? Kiba, after a short chase, managed to locate the group as they stood in front of one of the many illusions Akino had created of the old schoolhouse. It's a fake? Burent exclaimed in surprise. Oh, come on! How much more of this forest do we have to search through? Noticing his opportunity, Kiba decided it was time he made his appearance, though, apparently, he didn't go unnoticed. Focus! We're not alone! Isabella snapped, noticing Kiba's presence. Whoever you are, come out! I know you're hiding. Well, who am I to decline orders from someone such as yourself? Kiba answered pleasantly, giving his dashing smile as he emerged from the forest. My name is Kiba Yuto. A knight in the service of Rias Gremory. It's a shame he's on the other side. Sharia sighed. You're really my type, Blondie. I swear, the lot of you. Isabella grumbled. Don't underestimate him, or you'll find yourself quickly retired. You worry too much. We outnumber him four to one. Marion insisted, preparing for the fight. If that's the case, I don't think you'll enjoy my surprise. Kiba smiled again, drawing his sword as the four were surrounded in crimson-colored magic circles marked with the Gremory crest. Shall we begin? Damn it. I told you. Isabella scolded. I'll take point. Try not to die. How much longer until Kaneko gets here? Kates asked. Oh, who cares? Yuma waved her off, cuddling with her familiar. I'm sure Rias will be along with instructions any second now. Perhaps, but we still shouldn't dash. Zenovia tried to say, but was cut off. Everyone! Get out of there! A loud voice shouted from the entrance to the gym. Kaneko? What's going on? Kates asked. Nadi! What are you dash? Yuma tried to ask, as the blue jolly pounced on her, completely covering her form. It's the bomb queen. She's about to dash. Boom. A massive explosion shook the battlefield, the entire gym being blown sky high. Shockwaves of superheated air shot out from the point of impacts, as rubble and debris from the building rained down across the area. My, what an easy task. The purple-haired queen sighed, floating down to inspect her devastation. Yubelina had long, wavy purple hair that shadowed her right eye, and wore a very revealing purple dress with a white overcoat. Fitting Riser well, she seemed to give off an aura of sensuality, in her tone of voice, demeanor, and choice of outfit. What a bore. I was hoping someone may be of some worth. One of Lady Rias Knight's retires, Grafia's voice announced. Oh? It seems I only defeated one of them? Yubelona mused. Yuma? 
Ketase? Zenovia? Can you hear me? What's going on? Rhea's voice demanded from the various communication circles. Kaniko? Have you arrived yet? As the dust began to settle, movement could be seen among the various piles of debris. A badly cut up and injured Zenovia stood, shaking off the pile of wood and plaster from her arms, legs, torso, and hair as she tried to catch her breath, most of her weight being placed on her sword as a crutch. A short distance from the entrance, Kaniko stood. She was relatively unharmed, especially compared to Zenovia, but much of her uniform was burned away and she was covered in soot and minor scratches from flying debris. In the center of it all was a large mound of blackened fur that shakily stood on four legs and moved off the figure it was covering. Yuma, having been sheltered by Nadi, was almost completely unharmed, but the Yali was in a rather bad way. The explosion burned its resistant hide, charring away much of its once beautiful shiny blue and gold fur. She whimpered slightly, giving Yuma a brief lick before laying down in exhaustion. Nadi, Yuma whispered, her eyes widened in panic. Why? I would have been fine. Why would you worry me so much like that? The Yali mewled and nuzzled the angel slightly. What if you'd gotten hurt even worse? Yuma smiled sadly and let a tear go from her eye. Go home and rest, Nadi. I'll summon you tomorrow to check on you. Please just be okay. I'll make sure I take care of the bad lady who did this to you. Giving another look and kneel to its master, the Yali returned to its place of residence to rest and recover from its injuries. Now, Yuma stood up, clenching her fists in anger. Who was it that would dare hurt my precious Nadi? I don't see how that makes too much of a difference. Yubalina spoke in her usual high and mighty tone. But if you must know, that would be me. That thing really can take a beating. I'm surprised all of you are still here. Please respond. What happened? Rias shouted through the circle again. Akino is on her way. They got Ketase. Zenovia replied coughly slightly. I'm a bit out of shape, but should be fine. Kaniko's just a little shaken and Yuma's fine, but Natty got hurt pretty bad. Damn it. Rias snapped angrily. I should have known they'd try something like this. Don't worry about it. It's chill, Kaniko replied, her tone still unchanging. We'll kick her ass for this. Three of Lord Riser's pawns and one of Rias Gremery's knights, retire. Grafia's voice announced again. Kiba! Rias shouted. He did well, President, Akino replied over the circle. It looks like they had too many of them to deal with. At least he took out three with him. I understand that, I just... Rias clenched her fists in anger. I didn't want to fail you all like this. Pieces will have to be lost, Rias, Yuma said in a rare moment of seriousness, still not taking her eyes off the bomb queen for a single moment. But they have to lose pieces too. For example, this queen is about to disappear before my very eyes. Yuma, what are you dash? Rias tried to ask. You hurt Nadi! Yuma shouted, releasing all three pairs of heavenly white wings and shooting off towards the bomb queen. I will destroy you, Zenovia! What's happening? Rias asked in a panic. I'm leaving with Asia now. Don't let Yuma do anything reckless. We still need Dash. Rias? I don't think you have anything to worry about. Zenovia answered. What? Don't ask. Kaniko replied flatly. Yubaluna had been caught off guard by the angel's speed and was now in a fully frantic defensive mode, desperately trying to shield herself and escape the onslaught of heavenly magic that was raining down towards her in the form of light spears and light magic beams, blasts, bullets and every other form imaginable. Her hastily made shields and well-placed explosions were helping a little bit, but not nearly enough. What's happening? She demanded. How can you be this strong? You hurt Nadi! Yuma yelled again, before unleashing another battle cry and chasing after the bomb queen once more. I think it would be in our best interest to never hurt Nadi. Zenovia commented over the communication circle. I agree. Akino nodded, landing behind the damaged temporary rook, now seeing the rage-induced B-down Yuma was hand-delivering to Riser's queen. But we really should get you and Kaniko to Asia as soon as possible. You can hardly stand. Right. Zenovia nodded, accepting the Gremory queen's assistance to walk over to the meeting point Rias had established. Lord Riser's queen retires. Grafia's voice announced. All right. Issei cheered. Now that's my girl. My girl. Gabriel thought sadly, puffing her cheeks out slightly. They're doing very well. Michael said, nodding as the group watched the games. It was a good strategy Rias used, dividing her forces accurately and swiftly to ensure the most efficient coverage of the playing field. Perhaps using Zenovia in the assault and Kate says a scout could have prevented the gym's destruction. Hindsight is 2020, brother. 
Raphael pointed out. There wasn't really a way of knowing that Riser would react the way he did. Besides, they took the space rather quickly. Kaneko was on her way to assist. Had they taken longer to lock the area down, Kaneko would have been there in time to warn them of the Bomb Queen's arrival. That daughter of mine can be so absent-minded. Griselda sighed. She's your ward, is that right, Griselda? Issei asked. Yeah, and a damn good one at that. Griselda gave a rare smile. But still, being caught off guard by that explosion is a failure that she's far above. She'll be running laps for that. Oh, give her a break. Issei chuckled. They're all doing very well. Everyone looks much stronger than they did last time I saw them. Gabriel praised. You did a wonderful job training them, Issei. Oh, me? Issei chuckled sheepishly. I hardly did anything. It was everyone else that worked with them individually. Perhaps. Bilio nodded. But then again, was it not you that assigned each individual trainer and assisted their training all as well? I guess so. If that's the case, I should get the credit, considering I got you to the point you are today. Yahweh spoke cockily. I, Yahweh, the absolute coolest god in existence, have once again proven my abilities to the world, and yet here you are sealed within your own creation, unable to escape for all of eternity. Issei deadpanned. Hey, that's not my fault. Yahweh protested. Then whose was it? Let me guess, it was some giant magical monster you fought that was created by the progenitor of all things because he was jealous of how good you were at creating stuff, Issei spoke sarcastically. And after the legendary battle you were too weak to deal with the heavenly dragons on your own, so you almost died. Is that it? How did you know that? Yahweh exclaimed in shock. I was being Sarka's wait. What? What? Wait, did that actually dash? Look, Riser's sister's group is getting to the next battlefield with the rest of Rhea's group. Let's pay attention to that now. I still wasn't Dash. Issei? Is father acting strangely again? Gabriel asked, realizing that he had stopped interacting with the conversation and hadn't even reacted to her leaning slightly more on top of him, rather than simply being seated on the sofa next to him like she had been. You could say that. He sighed. I'm not really a Gabriel, yes? She asked, smiling cutely at him. Something wrong? Nothing at all. He shook his head looking back towards the screen as Gabriel laid her head back onto him, slightly snuggling into his side. Roger that, Rias. Akino responded over the circle, cutting communications afterward. Everyone ready to go, meeting Riser head-on at the sports field. Yuma hummed. That's bold, even for Rias. I see you worked, whatever that was, out of your system. The queen replied, a slight sweat forming on her forehead. I'm not sure what you mean. Right. What about her? Kaneko asked jabbing her thumb towards the wounded Blunet. I'll be fine. Zenovia shook her head, trying not to show how much the explosion had actually rattled her. That's a good point. Akino thought for a moment. Why don't you watch her for now, Kaneko? The two of you aren't at full strength, so you can hang back while Yuma and I engage directly. That seems reckless. Yuma hummed. But fun! I'm in. Fine. The petite rook nodded. Let's rock. With Kaneko carrying Zenovia on her back, Quite an interesting sight to say the least. The group of four proceeded to the rendezvous point where they would meet up with Rias and hopefully take out the rest of Riser's forces as well. A bunch of low-class devils. No wonder you're so stupid. Ravel scoffed, arrogantly turning her nose up at the Gremry peerage. You're just running across open space. Foolish. And you're not? Yuma said back. If we're stupid you're just as bad. In fact... You're just standing in the open waiting for us, so you must be even stupider. You dash. The blonde huffed, puffing her cheeks out angrily. I don't think stupider is a word. Kaneko deadpanned. I must agree, it doesn't sound like one. Zenovia nodded from her shoulder. Whatever. Yuma mumbled. I thought it was a good comeback. Too wordy. Kaneko told her flatly. Not very creative either. Zenovia agreed. What are you talking about? Ravel demanded, stomping her foot on the ground. I'm the daughter of the Phoenix clan and I will not stand here and be ignored. You could definitely use some more simplicity, Akino advised. As your upperclassman, it's my job to help you with anything, you know? I'm older than you, Yuma protested. My he, Ravel ordered. Of course, Lady Ravel. The kimono-clad bishop nodded. Quickly creating a red magic circle, she fired a stream of flames towards the Gremry group. That wasn't very ladylike. Akino giggled easily forming a defensive circle to block the attack. Are you certain that you're a high-class devil? Ravel's face turned bright red in embarrassment and annoyance. It's not my fault you weren't paying attention. Akino, what are you doing? Rias sighed, 
having arrived with Asia in tow. I'm just teasing my cute junior, that's all. She replied with a devious smile. You're hurt. Asia exclaimed, ignoring everything other than the injured Zenovia and Kaneko. Here, I'll heal you. I suppose that's as good a conversation switcher as any. Should we deal with our opponents now? The Gremory King relented, deciding to let her peerage's antics go for now. About time, Naya! And I, one of the catgirl pawns, exclaimed. I was really getting bored, Naya. Agreedly. No. With the Princess of Ruin and the Priestess of Thunder here, we need to regroup with Big Brother. Ravel ordered. Maihi? Give us some cover, please. Of course. The bishop summoned another magic circle and a stream of thick gray smoke covered the sports field almost immediately. Don't let them get away! Rius ordered quickly, trying to take off before the smoke became a hazard to their ability to breathe. Right. Akino nodded, quickly taking to the skies to avoid the smoke. I'll take care of the smoke. Yuma volunteered, summoning a brilliant white magic circle. A strong wind came out of it that quickly forced the smoke to disperse. But unfortunately, it was not in time. They're already gone. Akino reported, landing back near the group. Of course they are. Rhea sighed. You couldn't have started before we got here? Like we planned to? Eh hey. Yuma chuckled sheepishly. We were doing pre-fight banter? Rias hit herself in the forehead before beginning to create a new strategy. I failed. Issei groaned, his head in his hands in disappointment. Pre-fight banter? Have I taught you nothing, Yuma? I'm sure, he he he, that it's not going to, he 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 he, matter much, Issei. Gabriel said between giggles, trying to stop herself from openly laughing at the situation. I'm a failure as a teacher. He wept. Yuma's quite unique, I suppose. Michael sighed, trying to repress Griselda's urge to punish her ward. So many laughs she won't want to have legs when I'm done. The angel growled lightly. Gabriel just kept giggling. Oh, stop exaggerating. You're such a child. I'm only seventeen. Issei whined, collapsing on the seraph. Why would they wound my pride so? There, there, Issei. She cooed, still giggling while gently stroking his hair. Gabriel's here now. You're using this situation to snuggle with Gabriel, aren't you? Yahweh accused. I have no idea what you're talking about. Really? Why would I use the fact that one of my girlfriends and my first brave saint forgot all of her training to add some comic relief to a raiding game that's necessary in order to protect a friend from being tied down to an unwanted marriage just so I can snuggle with the most beautiful woman in heaven? That doesn't sound like something I would do now, does it? But she's so cute and cuddly and dash. I knew it. Kerr. Scoundrel. All better now, Issei, I suppose. Issei sighed, realizing his time was up. Good. Now we can snuggle properly. Gabriel smiled cutely as he lifted his head. Dear whatever gods exist, thank you. I had no part in this. Damn you, Issei. Damn you, Omake. And that's the real reason that the Bible says you're not supposed to be gay. Yahweh, what the hell? Where did that come from? You can't just randomly say that. Did I forget to give the reason first? Yes. Issei thought in exasperation. Oh. My bad. Good grief. He groaned, continuing to walk through the mall. Why am I here again, clarifying for the viewers of your life which is an anime? My life is not an anime, Yahweh. Sure it isn't. That's why I had a cold opener. Anyway, your mother sent you here, remember? You have to get your school uniform. Right. That seems kind of outdated though, don't you think? Uniforms? Yeah. Why do we have to all dress the same? Because if you're all the same, no one stands out and gets bullied. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. They're just clothes. I don't make the rules, Issei. You were literally God. I didn't make these rules and I don't make rules anymore. Geese, Issei. I've been sealed for thousands of years. Whatever. So, how about a bet? Isn't gambling a sin? I can do whatever I want. Now, do you want to make a bet or not? What is it? When you get to the store, you'll accidentally bump into someone. You'll both awkwardly apologize, because you'll find each other attractive, and then head your separate ways. After that, you'll get your uniform, which turns out to be too small, which will become a huge hassle. It's because of this that you'll notice that the girls' uniforms are scandalously short, and you'll spend the rest of the day picturing how cute they'd look on the girl you walked into. What? It happens in anime all the time. My life is not an anime. Then take the bet if you really believe that. Fine. When I win, you have to tell me the most embarrassing thing that's happened to you and Michael, and you have to admit that my life is not an anime. And when I win, you'll buy that alarm clock. What alarm clock? I can't see you. Look to the right. That one. That's bold. You scared? Never. It's a bet. Thank you for shopping at Bed Bath and the great beyond, the only Christian home decor store. 
The clerk smiled and handed him his bag. Thank you, miss. Have a blessed day. Issei nodded. I knew it. Shut up. 